Okay. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Morning. Happy uh, New Year. Happy 2020. We will see more clearly this year. 2020. We are. So um, I'd like to officially uh, call this meeting to order. Um, we do have a uh, supplementary agenda, but it's actually a removal of a couple of items. Uh, Council has made notice of this, that um, agenda item 4A, I believe it is under invited delegations, um, Jim Lewis, item C, <coughs> will not be here. Uh, and when that actually happened, it also triggered uh, Paul Richards not to attend as well, we believe. So those two items were removed from our agenda. Frank Bellarique, we heard from this morning, is uh, tied up in a little bit of traffic. We expect him in here in about 20 minutes, so we'll continue on with some business and then circle back to Mr. Bellarique from Swift River. Uh, a couple things as we start in uh, today. Uh, one thing I do uh, would like to acknowledge, uh, we have a former councillor. Uh, those would have uh, seen a note today, but a former mayor of Muskoka Lakes, uh, William Buck, as everybody called him, Rogers, uh, passed away. He was our mayor between 1988 and uh, 1994. So I don't remember him personally, but I do know those who do. He was a fun individual. So, and uh, so we will uh, reflect on him. I don't believe there's any service planned for him at this particular time, Madam Clerk. So, but if anything changes, we would uh, alert council and the uh, public as well. Um, one other thing on, on that note, it's interesting, uh, and, I, and I say we can, we can be kind of caught in our little Muskoka Lakes bubble oftentimes, um, but maybe just a little pause to understand that we really are in a world economy. And over the last uh, sort of 10 days, those people would remember the tragedy of uh, Ukrainian airline, international airline flight uh, being shot down and 176 passengers, 57 of those I believe were Canadian. And um, uh, life as we know it as we enter 2020 can change in the blink of an eye. So uh, I encourage all of Council to uh, remember that. And uh, I, I'm thankful as we <clears throat> respect each other around this table, that we respect our neighbours and our friends and family, and we all go through different struggles at times, losing loved ones and people. So. Uh, a hug. I think I said that out before Christmas to reach out to a friend who might not get a hug. So uh, we'll do that. Um, one other little point of business. Uh, I do know that all of Council uh, worked hard prior to Christmas to put money into the food bank and, and put food donations. And I, I believe I'll look to our CIO a little bit maybe for some help and confirmation. Uh, there was one rumor that we won by a landslide, so to speak, in the uh, comment. But I think in a uh, pound for pound, or uh, I don't know that they weigh the uh, employees and the staff. Um, I did my best over Christmas to put on weight, let me say. But uh, I think we might be tied for Bracebridge, but uh, I think they're not still going to us. Derek? Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, my understanding was that uh, accolades were being sent to Muskoka Lakes for winning, but there's some level of conjecture as to the, the pound for pound as it relates to Bracebridge's <coughs> contribution, but I think the overall message is that everybody was fairly generous with uh, contributions prior to Christmas, and that's the most important thing. Wonderful, thank you. And I think uh, Councillor Zavitz also, uh, kudos to you, I think you organized uh, all of Council to make some donations in there, so uh, to Nalda as well, so thank you. Okay. Um, okay, do we have any uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest today on the agenda? Seeing none, uh, we'll skip over because our item B and C are deleted and Frank uh, Bellaric is a little bit late. Um, moving on, Madam Clerk, where we're going to some chair reports, do you think? Okay, um, let's go to general finance. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, so the December 12th General Finance uh, Committee uh, met. Um, Muskoka <coughs> Lakes Pickleball asked for a five-year uh, rate freeze. Uh, the Walkers Point Library updated us and asked for a continuation of a 50-50 matching funds uh, raised and perhaps up to $3,000 uh, an amount. So that would be considered and certainly come forward at budget. Um, staff presented a uh, stop sign location um, report uh, proposal. You'll see that later today. Uh, we regulated the Bala Bridge load at Bala Bay. 
Uh, and again, you'll see many of these items on the agenda. We heard and recommended that uh, TML adopts the uh, updated uh, district road service agreement in concert with the other uh, five municipalities. Uh, the committee received the 2018 to 2023 accessibility plan. Uh, we received 2018 and report and acknowledge that 2019 is forthcoming. That updated CAO duties and responsibilities bylaw was heard and is in front of you today for uh, your comment and approval. A, a counselor mayor compensation of benefits report was tabled and our recommendations are before you. Uh, grants to organizations report was discussed and the ECDEV uh, committee will consider the contents on January the 29th at their next meeting. Thank you, that's that. Okay, any questions? Councilor Zavitz on general finance. My regrets uh, to that meeting again. I apologize, I had an uh, issue in Toronto that I had to be with actually. Councilor McTaggart, our former Councilor McTaggart was at the same function that I was at, so. Um, okay, and we'll move on and we'll go to uh, Councilor Bridgman for your uh, planning committee. Thank you, Your Worship. So uh, we had another very active planning committee meeting in December with much public input. Um, so I'm going to highlight the, probably the five, five items. Uh, most of the rest are coming to you again for, for bylaws. Um, Duff's Cottages, the owners applied for rezoning of the residential designation at the waterfront. Many neighbors opposed this as they felt it would then become a prime opportunity for developers in the future. So uh, upon discussions with the owners, it, um, their, their stated intent was simply to build their dream retirement home. And the current home that they would be replacing is on township property. So after much discussion, we delayed the, the um, application and to allow them to apply for um, and buy the home so they can build their dream home on that. Um, the Mary, Mary Jane Lake subdivision was back in front of us uh, in December. Uh, district requested comment from the township on the application and in, uh, in progress with the, with the district's planning committee. There was much discussion by those for this application and those opposed. The discussion by councillors revolved around environmental concerns mostly. Uh, the result was that our planning committee has delayed response until two further studies could be completed. Uh, the, another interesting one was Brooklyn's Farms. Farm, an application um, will be before you shortly to allow a microbrewery within the barn on this property. Um, uh, we thought it was great as a committee. It's the encouragement of development of non-lake businesses and uh, we're recommending that this go forward. One observation made by the committee is that other jurisdictions like Prince Edward County and, and Niagara Falls to take these agricultural properties and turn them into some sort of tourist destinations. So certainly at the next OP, um, uh, in our next OP, I, I would love to see that and I suspect <coughs> that everybody would too. Um, sports courts. Um, we're recommending the bylaw that prohibits sports courts within 20, uh, 200 feet of the high water mark um, and this would be grandfathered to allow already approved and in process applications. The last one was inflatables on the water um, because there have been complaints about, uh, you can see how big some of these are and, and they're overtaking shorelines, but some actual owners can't get into their boathouses almost and if you look at the that but the um, the discussion revolved around perhaps trying to put this into our code of conduct and just having people become aware that that's what they're doing to their neighbors and correct the situation so I think I believe that's it your worship okay thank you council any questions of uh, chair Bridgman or of the committee Councilor Zavitz thank you chair I would uh, like to pull out for a uh, Further discussion uh, under the unfinished business of the planning committee, item 11A, uh, Ross. Okay. And I don't know if I need to state the reasons for that or at this point, or do I just announce that? Uh, I think a, a discussion on it uh, is appropriate. The um, And I know, uh, thanks for the heads up on this as well. The um, 
we don't really have a resolution on the table to say yes or no to, which is an interesting, and I'll just procedurally, the concept of our subcommittees was to debate some information and then make recommendations to council. Because we don't have a resolution on the table, it's difficult for council to say we disagree with the resolution because there's no resolution and that's where procedural bylaw. I think in this case though, there is a, and I'll look a little bit to the clerk for some help and guidance as to how we may sort of address this. There is some, uh, there is a direction by committee at this point to do some information. I think council, Councilor Zavitz wants to chime in on that, and I wouldn't mind chiming in on that eventually as well. So, Madam Clerk, I guess from a point of discussion, we're not really voting on a resolution. The minutes are the minutes. How would we discuss this going forward? <clears throat> because there's action to be taken based on the committee recommendations but council may want to confirm that or not confirm that. I'll look to the clerk and then I'll go to uh, Councillor Kelly. Well, council could have a discussion today or they could refer that matter back to committee um, for a further discussion. Or a motion, a notice of motion could be given for a future meeting to, um, to consider because there is no motion that's been like, um, been a passed or defeated at this time to, to pull out to vote on separately. So the minutes are the minutes. That's what was, uh, that's what happened at the meeting. Um, so there is no motion to pull out. So really your option sort of talk about it today, defer it back to committee. Or a council. Oh, correct. Or a council or a future council meeting. Um, or <laughs> if I had. Motion um, that would be included on the next meeting. That's another alternative. Okay, uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and, and through you, just uh, I, I ran into this issue last night. I spent a lot of time going through uh, two hundred one nine zero seventy nine, our administrative <clears throat> bylaw. And uh, I, to me, there's a two stage process here. I mean, right now we have draft minutes of the planning committee. Uh, they have not been vetted or approved by anybody, so they remain draft minutes. Uh, I think we can approve those minutes, and the only conversation that we can have on that particular piece is whether they accurately reflect uh, the contents of the meeting. Once that's done, I think we can pull out any particular resolution from those minutes and discuss it. And, and like you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't see a resolution here for discussion. That's the problem that I have. Okay. Councilor Shikawa. Thank you. Um, I, I think my concern is that, first of all, um, I have a whole list of stuff, my little booklet on planning that I didn't bring with me today about the comments that, that I had made uh, during the meeting. Um, also, I don't know where this discussion will go. So we can have a discussion, but in fact, we can't vote on anything. We, we can't, the applicant isn't here to um, you know, be part of the discussion. Um, so I, I would be happy to have this brought back to planning if that's, if that's gonna be happy or well enough. Um, I just don't see enough information in front of me to well, today. Okay. do anything uh, for that. Okay. Councillor Roberts. So um, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, don't really don't know what the issue is. It hasn't been publicly stated what the issue is with what planning did. So we've got to bring that out. Mm -hmm. And um, I still I think not uh, not being totally 100 percent. I can guess what it is. I, I too support going back to planning and giving all parties a chance to to uh, to 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 uh, present again. Okay. Mr. Jagowitz. <clears throat> uh, I'll reserve my comments. Okay. Councillor Bridgman. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to share with you and, and we have a discussion today. I'm <coughs> I'm fine with that, but I did have to <coughs> as long as we're talking about this. I did have two conversations with Mr. Ross. I know he sent an email to everybody. And uh, my first conversation he sent me 
the material so I didn't have to pull it all out again. Then I talked to a couple of counselors. So I, I want to share my second conversation with you because I said to him that I was not convinced that, that his premise was correct because his premise was that uh, planning did not understand that, that studies had already been done on this. So I said to him, you're, you're, you're a lawyer. You understand expert opinions on either side can be way apart. Um, so I said, and, and for me, this is still a planning committee matter in our structure and everything else. And so there are two avenues that I suggested to him. Uh, the first one was that he is more than welcome to delegate again at our planning committee meeting next month and uh, be happy to explain to us why he felt that perhaps the decision was not correct to, to defer this and bring any more information forward that he would like to bring. Uh, the second uh, option I said to him, and I know he'd been talking to everybody and it's his right that to, to, to do that with a lot of counselors, was to see, and this would have been at planning, but maybe that's here now, to see if anybody wanted to bring up under new business if there was an appetite with the planning committee to reopen this in the sense that perhaps we did miss something the first time around. Mm -hmm. So. Um, for all of you to know. Happy to Thank revisit it if we can do it on a procedurally yep. proper basis. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh. I don't have a full understanding. Okay, of the I'm issue? Question? Us. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, Councillor Zavitz, maybe you'd want to just uh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Uh, I, just in terms of protocol, that's all I was asking the question. Certainly, there is no mystery. To my mind, I sat over here, I watched, I, I, I was there. Uh, it seemed to me that um, the blending turtle studies that were uh, additionally requested and also the B-17 environmental, it seemed like it had all been done. And it seemed, it seemed that with the peer review and all the other, I mean, very detailed, what, what I'm simply, I'm happy for it to come back to planning. I, I just think it should come back somewhere. It should be further discussed because it seemed to me that there was there was well, no, it's not closed. But well, actually, if you, but if you will, if I might, sorry, certainly mm -hmm. for you, chair, the door is closed for what he's got to go away now and do more studies for six months, eight months, ten thousand, twenty thousand uh, dollars, or whatever. And if that's that is the will of that committee, my only point was it seemed that. Uh, the bank of experts, the Ministry of Natural Resources, and I'm not going to defend, uh, I'm not, because I'm not taking that side, I'm not, but it just seemed that all the information was before you. I'm, I'm, I'm all about the deferment. I think that, that makes sense, it's certainly. But the conditions that, that were imposed by the committee is what I would like this group to discuss further. Right. So, so your issue, and just, just to help, I think, summarize, is that in your opinion, and, and I think this is, this is truly why we have a committee structure, and we have a 30-day pause. And I will say, we don't always get it right. <laughs> we make mistakes. We're human. And uh, I'll be the first one to say that, that, that sometimes I've voted on something one way and I find out 30 days later or a year later or whatever that I made the wrong choice because of other information and or when we sit and discuss something for an hour or two hours, whatever, our brain's going all over the place trying to follow what's happening. So um, I, I think what you're basically asking for is as opposed to this at this particular point, going back to do studies, because that's planning's recommendation, is that there's more studies done. You're saying you'd like council to chime in on whether or not those studies are requested or not. So that's your prerogative, I think, at the time. Sorry. Councillor Jeglitz, right, is that fair? <coughs> Clarification. Councillor Jeglitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The reason I reserved is I wanted to hear what the Chair of Planning had to say, because mm -hmm. I, I think her remarks are, are quite important, and I support 100%. What she said, I think she's on the right approach. I think uh, the applicant is free to come back. I don't think uh, I don't think it's appropriate for us to deal with this matter today. I think it'd be better back to planning and then come back through the system. Okay. As they say, they're on a long journey. There's nothing in front of the district yet in terms of the subdivision. So I support the chair of planning. Okay. So again, what I'm hearing and what I think we need to discuss. Um, uh, there's no question there's nothing in front of the district because it's sitting with us <laughs> to put it in front of the district. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I guess the question is, and I think um, some people are wondering whether or not we need to do those extra studies or not. So I think that's a, a fair question to ask, and I think council can chime in on that. 
The question I'll ask Council, because again, where we have committee structure and then Council structure, do we want to bring this back, and I fully agree in a pause, that Mr. Ross, Ms. Green of the neighbors, everybody has an opportunity to discuss this if we're coming back to vet this. To, and again, I've heard very loud and clear over the past couple of months that all council like to have an opinion on this. So do we bring this to council and invite Mr. Ross and invite Ms. Green and the neighbors to discuss where we're at? Because if committee back up a month ago had have said we agree with the staff report, comments would be forward, we'd be discussing it here at this council table saying yes or no, and we may have turned it down. So uh, I'll look and just ask any comments. Do we want to come back to a planning committee with a portion of council at this particular point and then come back and to all of council and ratify 60 days or have we had enough public meeting and still public meeting at council, don't get me wrong, or do we just do this once and decide as a group where we want to go a month from now? Councillor Kelly. Thank you, and through you, uh, just three quick comments. I'm still not sure this discussion we're having right now isn't out of order because we haven't approved the minutes. That's number one. I tried to raise that a minute ago. Number two, um, we've been we we've bought into the concept that creating these standing committees with specialized focus operative word being focus on specific issues is the ultimate way for us to run the business of this township. And for us to take that away from this committee and bring it to council directly, to me, is the wrong thing to do. We've, we've uh, empowered them, we've staffed them, we've, uh, we've given them <clears throat> excellent uh, uh, chairmen, chairpeople, uh, and I think they're doing a remarkable job and I think they need to exhaust their uh, efforts to find the right answers before we start to meddle uh, as a group. I know I'm frustrated and a few others are that we don't get a vote, but that's how it sits right now. We don't get a vote. Uh, if we jank, uh, jerk it away from uh, planning committee and bring it back to council, we get a vote and uh, we get to overturn something just because we don't like it, not because it's the right thing to do. I would rather leave it where it is, uh, let uh, planning committee, I'd like to see it back to planning committee as quickly as we can get it in front of them because if there's a real issue here, and I have, I too had a long conversation with Mr. Ross and went through all the material and I'm not convinced. There's still a wide uh, division between the two sets of experts on these issues and that's the responsibility I think of, of, uh, of planning committee to make recommendations to this body as to how it gets bridged. That's my second issue and quite frankly, good news, I can't remember the third one. <laughs> Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, anybody who hasn't spoken yet? Okay, Councillor Zabbitt, so you have a final comment. Thank you, Chair. And I simply am concerned about it and I, my, my expression of, of interest is simply, I would like to see it discussed further at planning. So I'm fine with that. I don't think we should be discussing so, it here at Council. Barb, were you okay with that? Yeah, council? we'll put it on the agenda for next month for sure. Okay. Yeah. Committee, or Council, excuse me, we're good with that to bring this back to planning. And we will note that in these minutes. And from a procedural perspective, no, we haven't approved the minutes, but as we've discussed the minutes and there's action items in the minutes, it's appropriate to talk about the minutes. Um, and we have a little bit of a, um, I don't believe anyone disagrees with the minutes. We're, they are a record of the information. There's no typos in there, I don't think. So um, we have a little bit of latitude as to when we discuss this. So anyway, Council, if we're okay, we're going to bring this matter back to planning in February. Mr. Pink, are you okay with that? Okay. And we will serve notice, obviously, to the appropriate people that it's coming back for discussion. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, where am I going? Then it's there. We've got to... Pardon? I see that, but I'll finish this, I think. This Approve our uh, recommendations. Well, this is a recommendation, or this was directed about uh, <coughs> Okay, so there is, <coughs> in our planning committee, action items. Um, there's one minor variance uh, on 6D1. Mr. David, maybe you want to speak to that quickly, and then we can enact everything that we did last month. Certainly, Your Worship. Um, there's a relatively new section under the Planning Act uh, whereby if a property owner 
applies for a zoning bylaw amendment, they are prohibited for two years uh, to from applying for a minor variance application. And that's the situation uh, we're currently in in the property in the name of Amber Deal. Uh, however, the Planning Act does provide um, an option for council to pass a resolution to allow minor variances uh, generally across the township and waive this requirement or specifically in the case of the subject property. Um, Planning Committee discussed this uh, at December's meeting. Uh, the applicant's agent was there and presented to it and the Planning Committee did uh, recommend to council that a resolution be considered and staff has prepared that uh, uh, for today's agenda. Okay. All right, Chair Bridgman, do you want to comment on this or are you okay if I just read the resolution? Okay, anyone else? Okay, I have a resolution moved by Councillor Everett, second by Councillor Kelly. Whereas the site-specific bylaw 2018-125 was passed by Township Council on November 16, 2018 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 as amended to facilitate redevelopment of property described as part of lots 22 and 23 concession G Medora, lot 6 on plan M233. And whereas in accordance with section 45, 1.3 of the Planning Act, no person shall apply for a minor variance from the previous from the provisions of the bylaw in respect to the land, building, or structure before second anniversary of the day on which the bylaw was amended, and whereas the accordance, in accordance with Section 45.1.4 of the Planning Act, Section 1.3, uh, does not apply in respect to an application if Council has declared by resolution that such an application is permitted, which resolution may be made in respect uh, of a, respect, a specific application, uh, a class of applications or in respect to such application generally. And whereas the applicant has requested the two-year prohibition uh, on minor variance applications be waived for the subject property, and whereas it is deemed appropriate to consider the submitted minor variance application related to the subject property, now therefore be it resolved, Council of the Township of Muskoka Lakes waived the two-year prohibition um, to consider the submitted minor variance application on the property described as parts Lot 22 and 23, Concession G, Medora. Lot 6 of Plan M, 233, Rule 623011. All that to say, we're just providing extension. <laughs> I love language. Any comments, questions? All those in favor? That is carried. Hey, Madam Clerk, let's just <coughs> accept these minutes and action items. Uh, moved by Councillor Kelly, second by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved, the Mayor and Council adopt and enact the following minutes and recommendations contained in January 15, 2020, consent agenda and direct staff to proceed with all necessary administrative actions. 2000, uh, December 11, 2019, Council Meeting Minutes, December 12, 2019, General Finance Committee Meeting Minutes and Action Items 1 to 5, and December 13, 2019, Planning Committee Meeting Minutes and Action Items 1 to 5. Any comments? I have a comment, Madam Clerk, and that is in those minutes, we have requested that Mary Jane Lake have some studies undertaken. By enacting these minutes, are we still enacting, are we putting a pause, or are we able to put a pause for 30 days till we re-debate this at Planning Committee? Or do we need to make a specific mention? The, the specific mention will be in the Council meeting minutes today to direct that matter back to Committee. Okay. Okay that we're not really enacting it, that we're putting a pause on it. Okay. Just wanted to make sure and clarify. Councillor Kelly is confused. Yeah. <coughs> that, that's my third point. I'm confused. No, I, I'm... Uh, <laughs> we're not putting a pause on anything, are we? We're just directing that, that this comes back. To, I mean, I think it's at the applicant's uh, 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 discretion whether he wants to proceed or not. I, I don't think if, if I knew I was coming back to argue that I, it was unnecessary, I don't think I'd proceed with the studies, but there's there's no change to the to the uh, decision or lack thereof of the planning committee. We're just simply asking that it come back uh, for for another uh, another re review. I'll, I'll go to Mr. Pink. I think wants to chime in on this. Just if it assists, I, I would generally agree with uh, Councilor Kelly, Your Worship. I don't think. Uh, Council can change what happened in the minutes. That was the decision of the Planning Committee. The applicant was there as were neighbors. It's at their discretion whether they wish to follow through on it or not. Um, but we will advise them very shortly that Council has agreed that the matter could be revisited by Planning Committee in February. And presumably they may hold off on doing any additional work until that time. But uh, that was the decision of the Committee and the minutes accurately reflect that is, is my opinion. Okay. okay. And, and I guess the point being, or my, my question was if we have directed him to do certain studies 
he may be out doing these studies and spending money, whatever, that if we may be considering overturning, I think we just need to advise him that we may, we're debating this again in 30 days, or the possibility of this. Is that a fair comment? So I'm not, I'm not rescinding that right now, but um, David, maybe just help me for some clarification. I generally agree. I mean, he's, uh, again, he was at the meeting. That was the clear direction. Uh, I guess it's at their prerogative as to their timing on completing that work and whether they wish to do it or... That's their risk. I, my recollection of the studies, I believe it had to occur in the winter, so it might put them in a difficult spot whether to proceed with that work now or, uh, or take the chance that it might change. Um, but that's the situation. Thank you. Councillor Edwards? Uh, I don't think the uh, pause uh, matters at this point. There's not too many uh, planning turtles out in January and February anyway, so he probably won't be doing them through the spring. So, uh, I think we can uh, just, just bring this back to uh, committee. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, for, for clarity, I simply exercise my right as a councillor with our new structure uh, on seeking clarity. That's all, I, you know, I'm not trying to cause World War III. I simply brought it up because I sensed a lot of confusion in the room when the decision was made. So there should be no lack of clarity from where I stand. I simply was asking for more information. I wanted to ensure that the information that was available to everyone was acknowledged. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Kelly, final comment. Final comment. Call the vote. I don't anticipate that this comes back to planning committee uh, for to relitigate the whole issue. This comes back because there apparently is new information that the planning committee didn't have in its possession, and that is the studies are complete. And I think this is an opportunity for Mr. Ross to get back in front and either correct the record or put something new in front of. But I, I, if if we just go back and run through the same information, and and <clears throat> rehab, then and come up with a different answer, then I, the system something wrong with the system. I understand there's information that that the that the planning committee did not address its mind to when it made its decision uh, last month. And this is, at Mr. Ross's basic insistence, this is his opportunity to get back up in front and say, hey, you didn't know this, or you didn't see this, or you forgot about this. Not a, it's not to relitigate on the same basis of facts, it's just to basically help the planning committee in its mission for the right answer uh, given that there's some question whether they addressed their minds to all of the okay. information that had been presented. So, and that's fine. I don't want to advance a month from now the discussion. <laughs> I agree. We've just got to discuss the topic again, if there's new information or not. My only question was, and, and I understand we've, the committee has made a comment to Mr. Ross, and he can choose what he wants to do with it. So that's fine at that particular point. So you've all heard the resolution. All those in favor? That's just the approval of the minutes and the action items. That is carried. Okay, we're going to back up to uh, our 9 a.m. delegation. And uh, Mr. Bellaric, um, you have PowerPoints and everything else. Thank you. Hope traffic wasn't too, too bad. Yeah, we have uh, some images to show on the screen. Great, thank you. Welcome. That might be useful. Thank you for having us here. I apologize for being late this morning. So we, um, we, we propose to talk, I think there's four things we're going to cover today, we, if time permits, uh, Your Worship. Um, we're going to talk about public safety measures plan around um, uh, the dam and the hydro plant. Um, we would like to talk about the status of the project, where we're at. And um, we'd also like an opportunity to talk about the plans for the park, the schedule for the uh, uh, improvements uh, to, uh, to the park. and. Uh, the Ballot of Boulder, the Ballot Boulder, I think, is back on the agenda. Um, if we have some time, we'd like to uh, touch on that as well. Um, This would help you. <laughs> so, 
So uh, again, uh, thank you for giving Swifter the opportunity to uh, speak to Council here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we'll provide you with a project status, uh, an update, and we'll talk about public safety, uh, the Bala, and then my colleague, uh, Nyang, will talk about the Bala Boulder and the uh, part times. Uh, next slide, please. Um, timeline uh, for the project status. Uh, we started commissioning and testing uh, the project on January the 8th, and the schedule is to continue uh, testing and commissioning um, right through to about the 27th of January. Um, it's going uh, fairly well overall. We have not uh, ramped the machine up to anywhere near 100% yet. Um, we've been operating at an average of about uh, 7 CMS, uh, 7 cubic meters per second of water passing through the machine. Uh, we did a one point peak out um, at just under 30 uh, CMS. Um, the plan is to slowly ramp the machine up, see how it responds to this operating regime, um, and eventually peak at 100%. Um, and that will be occurring um, as we approach the 100% mark, probably the latter part of next week, if we, uh, if we don't encounter any new uh, challenges or problems. Um, once we conclude uh, the final testing and commissioning, uh, the plan is to put the project into uh, uh, operation uh, from that point on. Um, operations. Um, the plant will be operated locally. We've hired local people to operate the plant. Um, one fellow is in, uh, is in Bala. Um, these are the station operators. Um, the one is located in Bala. He could see the power plant from, from his home. He lives on the Moon River. Uh, the other fellow is in uh, Port Carling. Augmenting them is we have a team of who we're calling loggers, and that team is seven people, um, and their job is to uh, respond to calls to manipulate the logs on the north or south dams as required. Okay. Um, these individuals are going through their training right now. Um, M and RF has really stepped up to the plate with us here. They're providing ample opportunity uh, to train us, to train our loggers on safe operations, safe activities around the dam. Uh, they're providing mentorship uh, to our staff, um, both on dam operations and uh, lake level controls. So uh, we'll continue working with, uh, with MNRF. Uh, there's no timeline. MNRF is not saying you only have three lessons left. They're um, taking it uh, one day at a time. And uh, as Dan Devin, who's no longer involved in the project, he was with m and from a few new times. He was the uh, general manager for the region. Um, he said, we're just not going to let you out there and start operating this thing until we feel you're ready. And I'm really glad that they're taking that opportunity to do that. So we're going through some training, as I said. Um, SREL will eventually be responsible for managing the Bala North and South Dams. We currently are not. Right? That's with m and RF. We are working alongside MNRF in manipulating those logs as part of our training. Okay, so when they're out there to do the logs, our teams are with them uh, to uh, uh, observe and practice along, along with MNRF. Um, and eventually, <clears throat> uh, we're going to be given responsibility for maintaining uh, the water levels in accordance with the uh, water management plan. We've um, successfully concluded that amendment. Uh, to the water management plan. Uh, Swift River is uh, officially a stakeholder along with Aurelia Power and Ontario Power Generation, uh, Bracebridge Generation. Um, what the, I don't have to type it, the water management plan sets out the rules and responsibilities for managing the watershed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this, is, this photograph was taken on uh, the 5th of December, um, courtesy, by the way, of um, Ron Brent. Some of you may know uh, who he is. He flew over the planet as he does from time to time, and he took this picture. We could see um, um, the powerhouse here. This is the newly constructed observation deck of the past that's going here to the deck. This is a non-public area. This is the deck that we got to. The water comes up here. The water enters the hydro plant here. Those are the newly installed safety boards. This is the existing MRF safety boom. Um, this is the dam, obviously. Park, and this is the parcel of land 
picture of construction of uh, activities at the power house. Um, you have talked about these things because there's no water on the food source. This is what they call the late summer photograph. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Cheryl, there should be a video um, that goes along with this image. And we can actually take that and make that image spin to the turbine. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, we're inside the powerhouse. Um, this shaft couples the turbine, which is very uh, deep in the water passage, um, and it couples it to a very large gearbox. The turbine spins at about 105 to 110 RPM. The gearbox here excites that and increases the speed to about 700 RPM, which then drives uh, the generator that produces the electricity. This was the um, second time we spun the machine. Next slide, please. Um, this picture is hard to tell, but you're looking, we're looking down the draft tube <coughs> into the pit where the turbine sits. This shiny surface. Next slide, please. Um, we're now inside the turbine uh, building, uh, our building rather. Um, this overhead door, the large overhead door, on the south elevation of the building. This is how material will be delivered into the powerhouse from time to time. Supplies consumer lights. This is the front door of the powerhouse. shot of the generator. Uh, that's serpentine orange cable coming out. Those are the power lines leaving the generator going to the transformer inside the powerhouse, which boosts the voltage to match the voltage out on the street. The grid voltage which is 44.9. Um, and the photograph to the left is just a general view inside the powerhouse and the stairs going up to uh, street level in the mezzanine. Next slide, please. Um, this is the commissioning team, part of the commissioning team at work. Uh, they've set up stations with computers, um, uh, which they need to, uh, to teach the logic here on what to do and how to respond to things. Um, and, and really, that, that is the best way to look at it. We're teaching the computers that will run this powerhouse how to respond. and so on. It all gets taught. Next slide, please. Um, I'm moving on. Sorry, before I move on here, any questions about the status of the project right now? Because I'm going to be talking about public safety. Thank you. <laughs> Frank, um, Frank, if I may. So the only one question I do have, yeah. um, and I'm not sure you can answer it, I guess, at the end a little bit, but you brought it up in this port, that there has been a revision to the MRWMP. Correct. An amendment, yes. Uh, has that changed? If I was to look at the MRWMP in November, December prior to the uh, amendment, have water levels <clears throat> at any given time of the year changed with that amendment? No. No. No, they haven't changed. 
um, Swift River's amendment did not change any of the operating regimes or water levels or best practices okay. for managing Lake Muskoka. We are required to maintain Lake Muskoka, uh, what they call the BMZ, the best management zone. Um, and MNRF dictates what that zone is. Okay. And it's the same zone that was in the plan before the amendment. So the amendment, uh, Charles, just give me a pointer so you can point to the screen. Um, so the amendment specifically adds you as a signature, just trying to give a, an understanding, uh, anything else that might be contained at a high level of that amendment? That's correct. We become signatories to the water management plan. We ...abilities in the water management plan. For example, we have responsibilities to communicate with OPG downstream, with okay. Chris, our neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, the operator of that small hydro facility just to the north of us. Um, uh, operating regime has been developed. We explained to MNRF how we will be operating the dams, how we will be operating the power plant, how we're going to communicate with the others on the watershed. We, uh, uh, we met with the Standing Advisory Committee, um, walked them through the amendments, um, we met with all the other stakeholders, as a matter of fact, and walked them through the amendments. Okay. Uh, Frank. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. I have, I have two questions. Uh, well, one is, um, as you've explained, uh, the, the, the management plan has a range of highs and lows that, that flow through the year, right? Um, in the past, those have been operated in a, in, in a certain manner, and, and the oper OPG has always felt if you're within the range, you're, you're doing the right thing. But would you consider, or are you considering, operating at the lower end of those ranges, just as a precautionary because of what happened last year? And then I have a second question, then you've answered. Yeah, uh, you know what, we wouldn't take that decision on our own. We would take that decision in consultation with um, MNRF. Um, there's the best management zone, and we've promised to maintain, to work in that zone. We've also made one additional promise, which is in all the documents that we've signed with MNRF, is that priority will be given to the user, to the recreational users of the lake, over power generation. Okay? So, if MNRF feels that it is in everybody's best interest to operate in the lower zone, they'll tell us to do that, and we'll cooperate with them accordingly. That's not a decision we'll make on our own. Just, just a supplementary uh, thank you, but uh, just, just a comment on that. I looked at some of the charts, and sometimes what happens when you operate too high is it spikes up, takes too long to get back down, and, yeah. and, and so you'll risk that. My second question was, and I, constituents have asked me, they don't see any power lines leading out of this. Where does the power go? Sure. Uh, the power line leaves the powerhouse, and I'll try and use this pointer. Uh, the powerhouse is located right here, where number four is. Um, a power line leaves the powerhouse under the road, try, sorry, I, I, underground, crosses the road here, which is Highway 169, and goes up a pole that's located uh, just across the street from the power plant, okay? Um, and then goes up that pole and connects to the, uh, the grid, to the local grid. So they were buried so that people wouldn't have to see them crossing the road. That was a design decision that we took. Um, on public safety, um, uh, things that were uh, things that were considered um, and uh, and drove the the uh, uh, the consultants who, uh, who wrote this, fire, this this life safety plan or, or public safety plan were things like um, the, the the tail race where the water leaves the power plant, the actual power plant, the intake to the power plant, um, and the existing safety features such as the existing booms here and, and here. Uh, we also considered um, the railway bridge spanning this uh, uh, area here. Next slide, please. So the consultants, and it wasn't just one consultant, two firms were retained to write this uh, public safety measures plan. They were WSP and KGS. Both of them have a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise when it comes to writing public safety measures plan. KGS, for example, is on contract with the city of Winnipeg every year. They help Winnipeg mitigate uh, the flooding along the, uh, the Red River 
uh, that's uh, that's their role there. They help design um, uh, the measures there. Um, WSP, um, uh, uh, the lead individual at WSP, uh, Gilles Bourgeois, was also the president of the Canadian Dam Association, and the Canadian Dam Association guides developers like us in developing these public safety measures plan. How to identify the risks, how to weigh the risks, and what, how to mitigate those risks. So. What all, all the information we've gathered concluded the following, that we need to put in a safety boom here at the tail race. The safety boom will be anchored at the powerhouse building here and here. It will also be anchored here, 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 and here. Okay. These anchors won't be seen. They'll be in the water. Uh, they're just big concrete blocks okay, with chains going down. This is a this this has been designed to be a seasonal boom, uh, only to be in the water uh, during uh, recreational uh, times, during boating season. When, you know, people are swimming, people are using the rocks. Um, uh, our plan is to only install the boom during those times, remove it for the winter. Um, uh, we really don't want this boom in the water during freshet when there's copious amounts of water flowing over the falls. Um, we're afraid of damaging um, uh, this boom. We don't want to send it downstream. We um, also uh, decided to change the MNRF boom here. Um, currently, it's configured pretty much a straight line or a slight curve to it going across like so. Ours will be shaped like a, I don't know, I call it like a tent, circus tent, the roof of a circus tent. This shape helps in, 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 uh, in self-rescue. Um, the other features of this boom uh, and how they differ from the existing boom is um, they have handles built into them, so individuals that's in the water can grab onto it and pull themselves along if they find themselves up against the boom. The, the current boom, there's no, there's no way you can grab it. It'll spin. It'll spin. There's nothing to hold on to. Ours will have handles. In addition to the handles, down, and you, this part will be in the water, hanging under the boom is almost like a chain link fence-like material. It's about a meter deep, and it allows, an in, it'll prevent an individual who is holding onto the boom from being, um, uh, uh, from being pushed under the boom okay, and come up at the other end. Uh, this fence will literally keep them back. It also allows them to kick off with their feet. Okay? Um, in addition to the boom, we also installed safety buoys here, 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 here. And I have a photograph of that. I can show you um, what they look like in the water. Uh, these, uh, these buoys are to warn people, uh, boaters, swimmers, whoever happens to be in the waters around here and here, that, um, that there is uh, dangerous water ahead, and that they should exercise caution. Um, in addition to that, we've met with CP Rail, uh, and Young, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, met with them on site to encourage them to improve on, um, on the trespassing situation on this bridge. They've agreed. Uh, as a result, they've improved uh, the fencing along this bridge. They've also improved the signage. They've signed it with no trespassing. Um, and they've also given the local OPP permission to um, warn and ticket people that trespass uh, onto, onto the bridge. We, uh, that's one of the risks that was identified, obviously, as people uh, jumping off this, uh, off this bridge into the water. We want to discourage that activity uh, going forward. In addition to these measures, signage has been placed uh, in and around the power plant. Um, there's signage on, on the dam. There's signage on the walls of the powerhouse here and here. Again, just warning people to stay, to stay back. So those are the major, major ingredients. Sorry, uh, before I leave, there's one other thing we did. Um, we've installed um, uh, high-resolution, high-quality cameras looking uh, at this area here and downstream, also looking at the intake here and looking at this area here. Um, these images are displayed inside the powerhouse in the control room. And um, we'll be using those just to monitor the intakes and the, sorry, monitor the intake and the tail race uh, before making decisions to switch on or turn off or change 
or change flows. Photograph of the uh, buoys that were installed. Um, this is the existing MNRF boom that I told we'll, we're going to replace into that tank shaped one. And these are the buoys here. Um, we asked for this photograph, and I brought this photograph because I heard in a, uh, in a, was in a previous presentation, uh, maybe by Mitchell Schneer, that these buoys were somehow interfering with access to the municipal docks located over here and access to Perks Place, which is over here. As you can see, um, we're not interfering with the municipal dock or with access uh, to Mr. Perks' dock. This dock is still in the water to this day, um, which is unusual for him to do that. Um, I suspect he'll be taking it out shortly, but it's usually out by now, uh, but it is there currently. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a view of the municipal docks down over here. Uh, again, this, this area is clear. We don't have any uh, buoys uh, anywhere near this area. Next. Next picture. That's the one. So this is panning, and there's, and there's the, uh, the buoys that we saw in the uh, aerial photograph. And I continue walking under the, uh, the railway bridge and uh, come up near Mr. Perk's place. There's um, some of the new signage, the warning signs that were put up. There's Highway 169, and there's the powerhouse there in the background. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's it for the public safety. Um, is there any questions? I think we do have some questions, and you might want to back up a couple slides, I'm going to assume. <laughs> Councillor Zavitz had one. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. It's for you to uh, Mr. Bellarique. So I wonder if you could go back to the slide where you show the aerial of uh, the buoys. The buoy right there. Thank you. Uh, so, what makes the horseshoe uh, not safe? <coughs> and to the left, uh, as access to perks, uh, safe. Okay, sure. The higher velocities, water, are running down the center. Okay. In this, in this, in this direction, if I may. Obviously, in this direction. Really? Right. Towards the dam and the powerhouse. So it's the center that has higher velocities. As you leave the center and head towards the shores, the velocities drop exponentially. Okay. That's why. Supplemental. Thank you. Supplemental question to the chair. So it would be fine for me to send my 14-year-old grandson in there with a tin boat and go right up to Bill, Bill Perkis's business. And buy worms. Correct. That's well, correct. if I might, if I might respectfully, I've taken my 30-foot boat in there, and it's almost impossible in the old days. So, and I hope I'm allowed a little leeway here. But, you know, when you're, as I'm listening to you describe all of this, um, <laughs> you know, you're you're actually providing a venue to get to perks. You're not really, you've never used the word perk. It hasn't come out come out of your mouth. Yet you're talking about public I'm sorry, safety. I, I haven't mentioned Mr. Perk. Right now, here that I've heard, well, well, just, I've mentioned just, a few times. Just, so. just that, um, you know, the, re, the the dock is there. What would your preference be as uh, as the operator of this uh, facility? What would your preference be for perks? Uh, in terms of, oh, in sure, terms sure. of public safety. Well, for, well, this area and adapt, right, as we observe, right, and adapt. I don't think his dock configuration is the best configuration here. I would prefer to see a horse shape, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a horseshoe shaped dock, uh, U-shaped dock in this area, rather than this long one. And that's not from a public safety perspective, that's just from a flow. There's, there will be pressure put on this dock as the flows increase through here. The dock could come unanchored float downstream. They could do that regardless of the powerhouse running or not. When flows are increased over the dam, uh, things are going to get pushed in that direction. Right? So I would, uh, I would like to sit down with them and discuss 
possibly uh, his appetite for reconfiguring this dock, um, but something we would pay for if he's a, if he's inclined to uh, uh, to take our offer. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Through you, I, I just have a, one more question on this slide. That U-shaped boom that runs beyond Perks, is that the one that you're reconfiguring into kind of a I delta think, shape? Or it's, it'll, be, it'll be a brand new boom. So We're not going to use the existing uh, boom. Okay. It'll be a brand new boom. But what track, what of the track that it currently occupies will it still follow? In other words, what, sure. can you show me on with your pointer? Or? Sure. Thank it's going to use the existing anchors. It'll use the existing anchor at this end. Not this existing one. This will be pushed back here somewhere, and it'll be one in the center to create that, you know, tent yeah. top shape. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, I guess the only question I would say, uh, or, or concern, um, you suggest that uh, on the Lake Muskoka side, sort of east of the bridge, the train tracks will, um, that that center section is high velocity of water, hence the reason you've got those floating markers there. Yes. If it truly is high velocity marker, um, why are they just warning me buoys? Why isn't it an actual full safety boom saying don't go in here? Uh, sure. Um, well, it's, it's a navigable <coughs> water body, and that's the main reason, because it's a navigable water body. Transport Canada has rules, and uh, when marking dangerous waters in a navigable okay. water body, this is what you have to do. You have to use buoys. Okay. So, Appreciate that. And again, as, as you are probably well aware, uh, this council has expressed concerns to Transport Canada, to the province on this particular. Um, when you do realign uh, a different safety boom on the western side of CN Bridge from there, and again, if you hold your pointer halfway across the bridge where you propose to attach it, um, I, I wouldn't. You know, I, I've been boating my entire life. I've certified people in boating. I'm not sure I'd want to take mu anything more than a tin boat in there um, and to try and navigate with some water moving through there. Every single boat trying to go to Perch Place, no matter how skilled a boater you are, is going to end up on that safety boom. In effect, if I can be so bold, you're pretty much shutting down the boating business at Perch Place. Yeah, um can I comment on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, you're coming from a place where you're, you're saying, you know, SREL is responsible for uh, um, the situation. Uh, the reality is flow goes through there now. Okay? The reality is there's a dam. The reality is it's a runner river project. We do not increase the flow. We do not decrease the flow. We work with what the river gives us. If the river gives us 30 CMS, then we'll be passing 30 CMS. Whether it goes over the dam or through the power plant, it's going to pass by here. Okay. So, so in the summertime, when there's recreational users in the water, it's low flow times. Okay. We, unless there's a, a sudden rain event in the area or to the north of the area, right, it should be fairly stable conditions. Okay, I guess as supplemental, I guess this may come back to the MRWMP and an amendment there too, where you're talking about maintaining the same water levels. Um, has there been an amendment as to where water flows? We have two dams in Bella, yes. and predominantly right now, the water spills through the south channel, not the north channel. Have you made an amendment to change that water flow? Yeah, we, we, want, the, we want some of the water to right. go through the north channel. Towards Correct. the power plant. Obviously. Correct. So, in effect, you are changing the water flow through this channel. Yes, it's run of river, but let's just be very clear that what was, and Perch Place was not located beside the south channel, which accommodated 75 80 percent of the flow through Bala. Perch Place is now going to be located between 75 to 80 percent of the flow through Bala. And, and that's the fundamental change that has gone on with the amendment to the MRWMP. I'm not going to disagree, but I would add to that, I would add to that, uh, Your Worship, that um, a, a rain event could change that flow pattern. It's not just the power plant. Okay? A rain event in Lake of Bays, right, three days later, will send water through, through this dam. Understood. Councilman Chicago. Um, I, I have a concern that 
like currently there's no ru ru water running through the south falls um, I appreciate that some people feel that that um, that is not a major issue within Bala but it actually has been a, a, a huge part of our tourism uh, even the way that we've we've set up um, walking display maps everything else so I'm very concerned about that I'm concerned about what's going on today and what I actually see happening further down the, the, the lake um, but I also have not seen a picture of what is also what Divers Point will now look like and what um, we haven't seen any of that in, on any of the, the pictures that have come forward. Uh, it is part of the big picture. It is part of something that, that this company is in control of. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could get those in answers for me, please. Um, thank you. I, again, I'm not sure uh, whether you have answers to that specifically. Um, I, can, I can speak to Divers okay. Point. Yeah. Uh, Swift River uh, uh, is leasing the Divers Point lands from MNR. It came with the powerhouse lands. Uh, there was no change to Divers Point at all. Uh, it'll, it's being restored to the way it was before we started construction. We used it during construction as a staging area just to store some materials. Um, all that material is gone. The fencing is gone. Um, the site is back to the way it was. We didn't modify the, the site at all. Uh, Divers Point uh, is really is there uh, so that we can get at the anchors um, that are uh, anchoring the boom near Divers Point. Okay, I think it was more about the water flows that uh, you know. Yeah, I don't think you're as concerned about it. I'm, I'm assuming the ministry is not as concerned about. It, but I think it's a good flag question, Councillor Shikau, as we yeah, I, further I, this with the ministry, and, and I know they keep referring us back to you. So hence we're having this discussion. Sure. Okay. So. So are you talking about the boom that runs from Divers Point through the South Channel? I don't believe those the South Channel boom safety booms have not been moved. No, they have not. It's They've the existing trying. boom, and that boom will remain. That's the MNRF existing boom to remain. Yeah, and um, if I could talk about tourism to the falls, um, Go ahead. people you know people come to enjoy looking at water going over the dam, hitting the rocks below. That's not going to change. That's not going to change. There will always be a little bit of water going over. Over. No, I'm talking about the north. I know. Councilor Cash is saying, you know, we're, we're changing the patterns of water through Bala from the South Falls to the North Pose Falls in this. So um, I'll let you keep going. Whatever wants to circle back, I think, at the end. We'll turn some lights on if there's any other questions. Great. Great. Um, so I think the next uh, presentation has to do with the Bala Boulder and the park. Please. Uh, hi, my name is Nyung, uh, and I currently <coughs> I currently serve as a VP of Development for Swift River. Um, if I could please get the previous slide. Thank you. Um, so when we started the project uh, construction back in 2017, it was sometime in the fall, uh, shortly after we started uh, excavation of work around the powerhouse, um, just to reminder as a refresher for some of the council members who weren't there at the time, we had, uh, through one of our engineers, uh, revealed um, that there were some old engravings found on rocks uh, at the excavation site dating back to uh, as early as 1888. And uh, at the time, our team had retained um, uh, experts in archaeology to um, date uh, and trace back the historical uh, background of these engravings. And uh, it was found at the time that it held some uh, special uh, historical and cultural significance to Bala. Um, and so our team at the time decided that we would um, try to extract the rock and take it out of the construction site while um, <clears throat> uh, work was being done to protect uh, uh, this rock. And uh, so the original rock is uh, engraving was found in a quite larger site, and that's the photo on the bottom left. Um, and uh, on, on the bottom right there, 
the, the final rock is, is about 10 tons, and the entire engraving itself was preserved, and it's been in uh, storage at Muskoka Rock uh, in Bracebridge for the past two years. So um, we're here today to, uh, uh, after discussion with our team, to um, uh, present uh, the fact that we would like to uh, give this artifact uh, back to you, uh, the, the community. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so we understand that um, sometime last year the Heritage Committee met and discussed uh, what they would like uh, to do with this uh, rock uh, uh, and uh, it was decided that uh, their preference would be for, uh, for it to be placed back into the public park. So um, that is our understanding of the, uh, the intention and the decision and the wishes of the Heritage Committee. And uh, if we can have consensus uh, on this, then um, Swift River would be fully willing to support that. Um, and uh, also to address um, the park plans uh, uh, in keeping with the commitment that uh, Swift River made with, township, uh, with the township many years ago, um, uh, and if you recall, the council at the time had granted us uh, permission to use these adjacent lands um, to do our construction. So um, we have finished with the construction of that area, and that area has been graded and is ready for the next step. So um, at the time, there was a committee formed, a park committee formed, to select the design of the uh, park. And the current design was selected because it uh, reflected um, certain sensitivities around the cultural and historical significance of this area. Uh, so um, we will be uh, intend we will be carrying on with those commitments and uh, be starting work on the park uh, this spring, probably not sooner than after the Victoria Day weekend. So we will be going out to tender. We've had uh, expressions of interest from uh, several local companies, and we'll be sourcing materials and plants and, and species uh, in accordance with that. So um, the final slide is just to show you some of the details that have been worked out. So the plans had been agreed to many years ago, and there is no change to those plans. So uh, we will be carrying it, it out uh, as we had uh, you know, promised uh, to that council many years ago. And that's uh, the conclusion of our presentation. So thank you very much. Okay. Any uh, uh, council, any questions for Jung on this particular portion? Councilor Nishikawa, then Councilor Roberts. Oh, Councilor Roberts first. Can you, with the highlighter or with the, can you show exactly where the rock is going to be placed or approximately or where it was? Because I don't know any, I, I know about the rock, but. Well, um, so there's, uh, you know, I don't think a specific spot has been uh, okay. selected for the rock. Um, so these designs and these plans were made, I think, about three or four years ago. Um, so we would have to, uh, I think the, the Heritage Committee decided that they wanted the rock exactly as it was extracted to be placed back without any modifications, just exactly as it was to preserve uh, what was there. So um, we would we would have to select a place, and I think that would be, uh, you know, happy to, as I said, just accommodate or, or um, it's really the community's decision of uh, where it should be placed. And uh, we'd, we'd probably just have to create a mount for it so that it sits properly on the ground firmly. And that's the, the, major, the, the only task. And then we'd have to uh, adjust the design slightly for uh, the contractors to, um, you know, place it and change the flora around that. Okay. I know that um, Mr. Pink wants to speak on it. Uh, our general committee back in October did request that this would be placed at the entrance to the park, is what we had suggested at general committee. Mr. Pink, did you want to add anything further, or was that the comment? The Heritage Committee, uh, my recollection, did identify a location, and it was at that uh, Essentially, the entrance. I think one of the other slides shows the so trail sort of looping through, roughly in that location. Roughly here. We'll call it the trailhead. Okay. Somewhere at the trailhead. Okay. Councilor Shikawa. Thank you. Um, again, to you, I 
I'm going to express my concern again that decisions that were made and I don't believe that they were pro properly vetted through the, the public um, about this park are going to le leave us with um, expenses that we never, uh, the taxpayers shouldn't be um, asked to pay for and ongoing expenses also to maintain something that um, was a natural area uh, and, and people have, have expressed their concerns to me that it, it should still remain or become um, more of a natural area given the steep slopes that it is not um, uh, there's not an understanding of how this park could actually function as p most people would think of a park so I, I hope that there's an opportunity through our, our parks committee to have further discussion. Uh, I'm very, very concerned that we are being asked to uh, ask the taxpayers to uh, maintain something that we didn't ask for. Um, respectfully, I think this council did ask for that. Well, not this council, but the council of the Township of Muskoka Lakes did ask for a park to be built, and that was part of the trade-off in providing the land. So um, uh, we're getting a park. <laughs> it, uh, I, I understand the uh, cost factor of it, and, and I guess maybe a little bit I'll look to uh, Director Becking or even uh, Mr. Pink, who was here at the time, from a uh, or Swift River. Um, the committee that designed and, and approved, was it our Heritage Committee? Um, because I remember it was presented at Council and we said yes. Maybe a little background as to where we are. I, again, um, I, I'm concerned about somewhat of a moving target because we've been given Swift River marching orders saying this is the park you're going to build. And now changing that. Um, and I'm wondering where, you know, I don't mind modifications, I, my perspective, but um, trying to understand, again, maybe, again, Mr. Becking can comment on, again, what we anticipate the ongoing costs. Is it lawn cutting? Is it whatever that would have to be done if there's grass in this park? Is it all natural? I think the idea was to be as natural as we can yeah. throughout the park so that there was minimal maintenance. Uh, beyond potentially a spring cleanup and some garbage can removals, but I don't know. Uh, I'll look to uh, Mr. Becking or also uh, Mr. Pink to comment as to where and how we got here and where we think we may want to go. Um, with respect, Your Worship, uh, I think Mr. Pink is in a better position to speak to what has gone on in the past. Uh, with respect to go forward, uh, my understanding of the design is that it's to be a fairly low maintenance. Um, but I would suggest to you uh, it's not no maintenance um, and I think from a purely practical point of view uh, you know we're probably uh, going to have to operate for a year in order to truly understand what the costs are. David? Um, my memory may not be 100% uh, accurate but I do recall extensive discussions I believe a committee was struck uh, to review the park design and there were uh, members on it. Uh, many discussions were had. I, I'm certain the Heritage Committee also reviewed it. Uh, and I believe a Heritage Conservation Easement, uh, an agreement registered on title was entered into to ensure the park uh, and the property will be put back in a state that Council approved. So it's quite likely um, even relatively minor change of putting the rock on may require a, an amendment to that agreement. Um, as they're bound by it uh, to put it back in that state. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, Chair. I would um, echo some of Councillor Nishikawa's comments. Certainly, I beg, I beg you, I beg Swift River to uh, work with someone on the council. I would be happy to put my hand up or someone else. You know, one of the diff difficult things about this project has just been that the perception that Swift River has not communicated with the community. You guys get an F minus only because I don't have a G in my categorization. And thank you for this leeway. But um, 
it is at the end of the day when everybody's gone it is a public park it will be a public park and you know if it's a park it's a good thing so I think we should work uh, to uh, get the best we can out of this and a positive go forward and I, not to be negative but you know on, all, on a number of other things that Mr. Bellary showed today we, we simply have to accept this and, and, and I, I don't think that's going to ever change, quite honestly, in terms of the ballot perspective. So I think it's wise for you to be seen as working with someone that then can, you know, pass information to others. You need to communicate with us. You haven't. And I think you, th that's the questions you're getting today. Mm -hmm. You know, really the first time we've had a chance to ask very directly of some of these things. So I beg you to include us in this final piece. Um, Councillor Zavitz, if the perception has been in the past that we weren't willing to work with the community or with this council, um, then it was us that failed in, you know, clearly uh, demonstrating our intentions. And, uh, you know, we'd be happy to work with you uh, or the member of this council to um, just, you know, not look at the past, but look forward. And so, see, so do what we can today to make this better for the community. Uh, so, I, I can say that uh, I'm speaking on behalf of me and my colleague Frank, uh, as well as all the team members, uh, you know, at our company. And again, we apologize if, uh, you know, if in the past the relationship hasn't been better. Uh, we understand that we will be in the community for a long time and we would like to work towards improving our relationship and our perception in the community. Okay, so I think there's a good, and I appreciate Councillor Nishikawa's comments and uh, Councillor Zavitz as well. I think probably what should happen, and I think our Parks Committee is the right committee, um, that maybe Mr. Pink, for the next meeting of Parks and uh, Trails, that some of the background, how we got to this stage, what is approved, and especially if there's going to be have to uh, an amendment to the uh, heritage easement and everything else to put the boulder in, that we do let our parks committee chime in on that and then come back to us. Um, uh, understanding, and again, I'm, I'm cognizant that no, this council has not approved what's gone on, but the council of the township of Muskoka Lakes and. Uh, we need to respect our predecessors, whether we like the decisions or not, and we can tweak and adjust and main update as we need to go forward. So that I support, and um, uh, let's just uh, make sure we have we know what we're getting. You're not starting work till uh, let's say June, and uh, let's just make sure we are crossing all of our T's and dotting our I's because it is our park in perpetuity. So thank you. Uh, any other questions? Alan, do you want to turn the lights back off? <laughs> Sorry, it's... Uh, it's through the chair, actually, to, to, uh, and that to uh, Mr. Belderoops and that. Uh, on the, the, the safety and that. Uh, who Frank, maybe do you want to come back up to the podium just so oh, we yeah. can hear you. And, you and thank you very much. Who is ultimately liable for for any any safety issues? Well, I think everybody gets blamed in that, in that situation. Yeah. I think uh, I think you know MNR, Swift River, maybe even the township. Uh, we uh, that's just the reality, right? Everybody yeah. gets sued. And second question, and and that's who, and that's who yep. chair. Uh, Looking at the at the existing dam, and you, you say it's the, the 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 length of this room, with the water's going over maybe a foot or something like that, and then what is the height of the intake, like underwater? Sure, um, from the top of the intake, yeah. and the top of the intake, it's just a concrete sill. Right. That concrete sill is about a meter above the water level. So from the bottom of that sill, our intake goes down about 11 meters. 1133 feet. Okay. okay. Now that creates a, a, a venturi effect, does it not? It should not. It should not. Venturis are very bad for Well, that's for, what, that's for what I'm, I'm wondering. <laughs> and and our, design, our design does not allow for that. We uh, mitigate it. There's features that have been installed in the power plant to mitigate uh, the venturi effect. For example, out, out in the intake, if uh, 
Michelle, I don't know if you can go back to um, the drawing of the public safety measures plan. Uh, right here. Uh, no, uh, forward one, please. Right here. So um, this is the intake here going across. Um, the water is coming underneath the railway bridge, underneath 169. See this here? Mm -hmm. This is a concrete wall. Okay. It's a substantial concrete wall anchored to the riverbed. Its job is to direct the water smoothly into the power plant to avoid the venturi effect completely. Okay? There are two other smaller walls that also help guide the water into the power plant. One here, another one back here. These are well below the water line. Okay? They're, um, on, when the water is really clear, you can just see the top of the wall below the water. Okay? Um, they will never be dry in the dry. Um, and they're there to uh, prevent that swirl, that swirling from the curve. Well, I'm not so worried about the swirl. What I'm looking at is a, 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 a 11 meter undertow. Yeah, okay. So the, yeah, I mean, it would be disastrous to get pinned up against that gate. Yeah, okay. It would be disastrous. Thank you. Right? But the same thing, it would be disastrous to get pinned up against the dam. Right. It's the same risk. Let me get your microphone on, Alan. That'd be great. With the dam, you've got the the, 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 the whole width. Uh, how many meters is it across? Uh, they're about 12, 11 to 12 feet wide, each, each sluice of the dam. So each section of the dam, here, 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 there's seven of them. Sorry, there's six of them. Seven piers, six sluices. They vary in width from 11 to 12 feet, and they vary in depth to as deep as 20 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're just logged. You know, I, I really you're just seeing the top of the mm -hmm. logs. MNRF, for example, half stripped them completely right down to the bottom during high flow times. Mm -hmm. um, when we had divers in the water installing the cofferdam anchors in this area here, one of our divers um, noticed that there were some members of the public that gone that went past our construction area and we're diving in this area. They bumped into each other underwater. And that really scared our divers to hell. It really worried our divers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not because they bumped up against this guy, because of where he was. He was up with he was up against the dam walls. And it wouldn't take much to get pinned up against that dam. It leaks. The dam leaks, right? In between mm -hmm. the logs, there's water going through. And if you find yourself up against that dam, it would be very easy to get pinned there. So the same, my point is I'm trying to drive here, is that, yeah, we have that risk here at the intake. I'm just saying that risk exists here and at the south dam as well. Okay. Thank That's you. Ms. Thank you. Through you. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up to that, was it ever a consideration or part of the conversation uh, on the bridge of the, the walkway? It's a high-traffic walkway with this not a really here? high railing. Yes. Yes, the written yes. And that, I'm just saying that that's a high traffic railway that, as you are describing this, some little toddler goes over that bridge. Yeah. It, was that, I'm just asking the question if that was even considered in, a, in the safety plan. Uh, people, uh, the area is signed to stay out of the water in that area, right? Whether, whether you go into the water from the bridge or go into okay. the water from the land, uh, nobody should be in that area. We're not permitted to be in that area, in that water. Thank you, through you, Chair. So it was pointed out to uh, <coughs> Chair Clink when uh, he attended, um, once you installed all of the north channel safety areas, and uh, we did a walk around, and it was pointed out to the Chair at that time that you could stand exactly where Councillor Mizan was talking. I could have jumped got up onto the railing and jumped to my death yep. at, the, at, the, at the hydro plant, at the, you know, yep. at that bridge right there. Yes. And I hate to, at the, at the, at the danger of having you install some safety. And you can't, right? You look at, you go back on that and have a check on that. Man, it's, uh, it's four feet high the and I'm in the water. Sure. I'm diving in the water. Sure. I'm right in the hole. So. Sure. That's what Councilor Mazan is very specifically talking about. So it's a danger. Anyone else? Okay, Councilor Shikawa, and we're going to take a break. Thank you. I'll, I'll I just um, through you to staff. 
uh, Swift River removed the heritage plaque in um, the Shield parking lot. We did not. Excuse me. I, this okay. is me well, to you. Uh, okay, so thank you. We'll get clarification. Uh, I, I would like to have an understanding of where that is located and when it can be placed back in okay. that area. So I'll ask staff, do we know what happened? As there's controversy, so we will investigate what happened to that plaque and then uh, return it. I understand Prentice Swift River, they did not remove it. So it's been removed. Oh. No, I have a, I, with all due respect, I have a letter from the former CAO, Stephen McDonald. He investigated that plaque. It was hit by, uh, T, uh, by a snow removal truck working for TML. He had the plaque in his, posi in his possession. He asked if Swift would be interested in contributing towards the cost of replacing the plaque. We said, of course, we would be. We didn't have anything to do with it. We would want to help anyway. We will let staff at this point look at uh, returning that plaque and uh, figure out how we get it fixed. So, okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um, Mike, um, Council, do we want to have a quick question from uh, the audience? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Mark, yeah, please come up to the podium. That'd be great. Mike Webb, um, ex-resident of Bell, uh, now residing in Bracebridge at uh, uh, 10A Kimberly Avenue, Suite 107, Bracebridge. Uh, yes, I do have. A couple of questions uh, uh, and observations. Uh, one, Glenn, I wanted to mention to you that I think the Swift River has really gone overboard, and I participated in it. Uh, Twelve years ago or whatever, there was a scenic water flow um, uh, a group of people. There was about eight or ten of us, uh, uh, excuse me, were asked to contribute as to how the water flow through Bala would result. I don't see anyone else here who is part of that. Uh, I certainly was. And then there was also a, uh, a building uh, committee, which comprised of about eight residents of Bala, which, once again, I participated in. That was open to the public to come out to and do. I did. And as you know, I have presented here in the past. I'm not saying that it was the greatest project for Bala, but it was going to happen, and I think we all had to buy into, let's make the best of this as we could. That's why I contributed to whatever was asked, including on the Heritage Committee, because we did uh, uh, have some contributions into what goes on there. So uh, I, I, do, I do have to disagree with you that, that they haven't been open um, and they're uh, the big bad guys in Bell. Uh, I do have another question, though, for Frank Bellerick. And number one, I've asked him a couple of times and I would like to see if there could be an official answer uh, as a past resident of the Moon River. Um, I know the Muskoka Watershed Plan addresses stuff on Lake Muskoka. I am still uh, concerned about what that addresses on the Moon River, which is the outflow. Uh, as you know, I have moved from the Moon River, um, but I am still a property owner there. And um, I would like to know if more water could pass through in a... In a uh, uh, abnormal freshet situation, which could make the the flooding um, uh, between Bala and the moon shoots higher, because I hope that that is something that's going to happen eventually as well. Anyway, those okay. are my comments. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, and I think Frank can speak to this a little bit. Uh, what I did here, and just to confirm Frank's say, is there has been no change to the operating levels of the Muskoka River Water Management Plan, which does include the Moon River and outflows there too. Um, I, I guess that's the 30,000 foot view that there's no changes, but is there a potential because, and again, we're directing water from south to north or not, but is there a potential that there could be a change? I think is probably a better question to Frank specifically. In the uh, water management plan, the decision to increase flows that could impact negatively the Moon River lies with MNRF. Okay? It's not in SREL's control. Um, 
Is there the potential to release more water onto the Moon River? Yes, there is. By virtue of having the power plant there, it's another opening from the lake into the Moon River. It's got a capacity of 96 CMS, but that's 96 CMS of additional water that could pass over these dams or through these dams. The decision to increase, again, I'm repeating myself, but the decision to increase the elevation of the Moon River lies with MNRF. Okay? Um, we're not going to make the decision who to flood or who not to flood. Okay. We don't get paid enough for that. Thank you. So it's actually it's an interesting point. It gives us, I think, some more lobbying power with the MNRF, and I'll say this to Council. Um, with the inclusion of this plant, and, and I'll, I'll use round numbers, if my math was correct, in, in round numbers in the past, we could spill about 200 CMS from the South Dam, 200 from the North Dam. If I'm listening to you correctly, we're adding 96 to the North, so round numbers, we could almost spill close to 500 CMS at this particular point, which theoretically could compound the Moon River, theoretically, but it gives us more um, an ability to go back to the province to say, we now need to deal with Moon River shoots, and we need to find ways to speed up that portion. Because for since 2016, for those who sat around this table, you would remember, and Councilman Tag would as well, that we've asked the province to identify the limitations within our watershed and to find ways to move water faster. This is one of those choke points, because in the height of the flood this past year, Bracebridge was spilling 565, or 500, I think 30, excuse me, 530 cubic meters per second into Lake Muskoka. When only 400 was coming out, hence the reason Lake Muskoka continues to rise. But this does present a problem, but then also potentially an opportunity to solve further downstream. So I appreciate that answer. So thank you. Frank? Wrong Frank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to, that's okay. That's okay. I'm not addressing you. Well, thank you. I'd just like to add to that because, as you recall, during the spring flood, I did spend some time uh, at the chutes. I observed uh, the water the water very high in the Moon River and at the uh, dam uh, lower down, uh, wide open and almost walk across the river. And there definitely is a choke point there. I was aware that this 100 cubic feet per second will help. There's also the Burgess Dam. I think this council should take a stand and, and be pushing MNRF to look at that bottleneck, and at least that's one thing that could help. It won't help the entire watershed, but I think we should we should uh, take that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Councillor Jagowitz, we have taken a stand. <laughs> We've taken a numerous stand. The problem is the province right now isn't listening, so we continue to do that. Um, Council, let's uh, take a 10-15 uh, minute break, and then we'll come back. Frank, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Okay, Council. We'll try and get ourselves going again. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Council, thank you. And uh, I think everyone had an opportunity to talk probably to Swift. Appreciate everyone's comments. Um, district updates. Uh, Ruth, you ready? No, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I will say that the reason why my reaction was is because I have been really struggling with our budget documents that we're, we're working through right now. And uh, of course, w what has been going on with health services is. Uh, you know, the big news story is two hospitals and whether we take on a long-term care home. Um, other items that have been discussed are, of course, requirements with paramedics and a future station in West Muskoka. Uh, and also there, there's, I, I think I, I spoke about this before, but there, there is a service that the paramedics have been offering where they would actually do home visits um, or follow-ups with folks. It's not available in Township Muskoka Lakes at this point. Um, and and I, if, 
in, if this gets moved forward on, at a district level, um, I hope that those services can be made available to Muskoka Lakes, but it also may require an investment, um, a further investment from this council. So that's all I'll say today. But just so you know, we're, we're, Fairvern has been a long discussion um, that is taking over the long-term care home in Huntsville. Any questions, Barb? Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I, it's, I may be mistaken, but I thought that the funding for the whole area, uh, Muskoka, um, Simcoe, Muskoka, was being taken away in terms of the paramedics having that home visit program. I thought I read somewhere that the government was cutting that out. Ruth? So they approved it in 2019, the funding for 2019. They have suggested that it may go away. Uh, but of course, until the budget is done, the provincial budget is done, you kind of don't know. I'm not sure, you know, it, it's, it's not a large amount of money, but I would suggest that it would have great benefit. Um, I, I, I like the idea that, um, you know, the, them checking in on that person that they knew that they just picked up from a heart attack two weeks ago or whatever that looks like. Uh, and uh, I think that's great. Um, In this budget, we would only be looking at carrying forward until April when the provincial budget gets approved. Council Edwards. Uh, okay, we'll go to Councillor Jagowitz. We'll go to Councillor Jagowitz while you review your notes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll start with the uh, Finance and Corporate Service Committee meeting of December 16th. At that meeting, they recommended that the district approve the one joint investment board agreement and invest 100. with this venture created by AMO. <coughs> Just as an aside, 37% share of that 180 million is 66 million, and we have about eight to 10 million in our reserves that we can use. At that meeting, a long-standing agenda item to study the cost of service provided each area municipality was removed from the agenda and referred to the newly formed Municipal Modernization Committee made up of the six mayors and the district chair. That committee will review the district council composition and other matters. So listen, guys, this next item is me, Frank, speaking to you, my colleagues. I believe that this is the time to do something for those that elected us. Next week, the district begins a detailed review of the 2020 tax-supported operating and capital budget at the committee level. Each of the four standing district committees will review their budgets and then meet on February the 7th as a committee of the whole and hopefully make a recommendation to council. As a result, a bylaw will be passed in March or April to adopt the budget for the general and special purposes of the district and to establish the tax rates to be levied on each area of municipalities. As I indicated to you in my email of December 26th, I believe more of our taxpayer dollars should be available to fund local issues. In order to do this, we either need to raise local taxes or reduce our contributions to the district. As you know, we pay 37% of the district tax-supported budget and only have about 21% of the number of properties of the district. TML taxpayers contribute approximately $30 million annually to the district, and I estimate this could be up to $10 million more than our fair share. I am this council's representative on the District Finance and Corporate Services Committee, and next week I intend to ask that committee and district council to reduce the levy on TML taxpayers by 5% annually until fairness is achieved. This 5% 5% represents $1.5 million in 2020, and it could take about eight years to achieve fairness. One of the ways to accomplish this is to classify certain budget categories such as policing, paramedics, community and affordable housing, material works, airport, long-term care, and hospital funding to classify them as special 
purpose items and allocate them to the area municipalities based on usage rather than assessed value. Section 326 of the Municipal Act authorizes this, and currently water, wastewater, and solid waste management expenses are levied this way. Another option is to ask the province to add a special provision to Section 474.17 of the Municipal Act. This section already contains an exception for Muskoka. I think it is important that I share with you, my colleagues, my intentions. What is your opinion? Thank you. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, report. Uh, let me ask you if there's any questions on what transpired at district on the uh, finance services, the first part of uh, Frank's comments. Any questions on what was going on? No. Um, Let's hold that discussion, Frank, if I may, to sort of a new business idea. Or oh, let's, let's counsel. Do we want to discuss now where he wants to go, or do we want to try and hold that as a little bit separate discussion? I'm I'm flexible as a new business concept. Ruth, do you want to comment? I would suggest, um, for the number of years that I've been a district councillor, that we haven't had a discussion around this table. Um, so I hope that we don't miss this opportunity, whether it's today or, uh, but uh, I think we need a, a fuller, I've always tried to engage all the rest of council to get back to me or to read something or do whatever, uh, but I don't hear feedback and so I really hope to start he hearing feedback from this council as a way, it, as, as district evolves even more, so. Glenn? Thank you. Through you, Chair. I personally did respond to uh, Councillor Jaglowitz uh, upon receipt of his memo. And I, um, I'm very interested in this. It's a very weighty subject. It's huge. Um, and uh, I'm very concerned about um, optics and uh, how, we, how it's presented. I think that's ultra important. So in my, I would welcome discussion here and now about it. Okay. Um, I just want to make a, just a quick comment and sort of just well, hold on, just a quick comment to Council. When we state an opinion in a group email to all of Council on how or what we are going to be doing, we are conducting business outside of this chamber. And we know that that's not supposed to happen. Okay? So I, I just, I'll make that statement at this point and uh, understand where that's going. Um, the uh, concept, and again, let's have a brief, I, I don't want to go for half an hour on this, but if we want to spend five minutes, I don't think there's a taxpayer that doesn't disagree or a councillor doesn't disagree that in many respects there is imbalance between Township Muskoka Lakes and other municipalities. OPP billing is one of them in particular that flags in our face. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Zavitz's comment that how we approach this, and I think Councillor Chow as well, is going to be paramount because you have to be careful, I believe, as we go down this road because my property and my neighbors, let's assume my property is worth double the value of my neighbors. My garbage now costs me twice as much money. Is that fair? Many would say no. <laughs> same truck, same cost of service. And yet, if we continue down many of these roads, our year-round residents who are not necessarily on our waterfront are not benefiting from super high assessed values and tax, their taxes and their costs theoretically are going to go through the roof. So, you know, I, I can't just look at what we're doing at the district. I, I have to look at overall here. And I think the, the point is, that we are trying to look at the district-wise, and I think Chair Klink has been um, very vocal that we need to find ways to do a better delivery of services, to do a better uh, financial review. Um, the CAO and I have had a conversation with Chair Klink on this very topic, and Mr. Dubin, which is, I think, possibly the formation of why we formed this new committee. Um, as to how we are going to modernize and understand. The province didn't tell us what we're going to do, so let's try and figure it out ourselves. Um, 
Frank, I believe, has every right to voice his concerns at his committee, no question. Um, I, I guess, Frank, are you looking for a, a council resolution at this point that says you want our support that this is how it goes? I'll ask that specific question. Um, we can talk about it, and, and I don't think you're going to get any unfairness <laughs> disagreement here. What would you like from this council? I would just like to hear from my fellow councillors as to what they think the course of action should be. Okay. Councillor Roberts? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Uh, Your Worship. Um, I've, I've learned of this issue when I started campaigning back in 2018 and started trying to understand why so much. And, um, uh, and through this last year, I've learned a lot. And um, I, I believe that um, it's key and paramount that right now we take little baby steps on this and we understand how uh, TML's uh, contribution is being used to benefit um, uh, non-township uh, Muskoka Lakes taxpayers, so how we contribute to the bigger picture. And I would like to see at February um, a resolution be presented that uh, the township form a, a subcommittee uh, comprising of uh, district councillors, because they seem to have the most experience in this area, and staff to document, first of all, s specifically the situation and what is happening. Before we do any, um, you know, ask for anything else, we first got to know exactly what it is. Maybe we don't have a problem when we, when we see it all on black and white. Mm -hmm. So that's my proposal. Okay, I'm gonna go down the room. Barb. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I agree. I think that's a great suggestion. I really want to understand where all of this goes at the district level. Um, your comment on the waste uh, thing, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, you're basing that on property values. I think I heard Councillor Jaglowitz said it should be on a usage basis. So I, I think that's what we need to get away from here. So on something like waste, it wouldn't be my neighbors paying half of what I'm paying we'd be paying the same thing if we had the same service. So I just wanted to point that out. You, you res the res property line, right? Respectfully, again, if I, my value is a million dollars and my neighbor is $500,000, the cost of picking up my garbage, I'm paying two to one to what they're doing, which is what the issue is across the district of Muskoka, because our assessed value in the district of Muskoka is so much larger. So the concept of splitting out and saying we're just going to pay for the actual cost of the service by property will have significant, again, if we keep going down this road, take it out of the district and we should look at it ourselves because we've got a lot of islanders right now who are upset that yep. they don't have solid waste pickup. And now we now need to factor them out of the equation and all of our little community homes here down the urban cores, their solid waste costs and property taxes are going to go through the roof. We are being subsidized, there's no question, across, let's just look at Muskoka Lakes, by our waterfront values. The district is being subsidized by Muskoka Lakes. Is there a, a better fashion? Absolutely. So the question is how do we find, at times, a more appropriate method? So. Councillor Roberts has a suggestion, and let's just park that for a second here. I'll go to Councillor Roberts. You want to comment in? Yeah, there, there uh, definitely is a, uh, a uh, advantage for living in in, in uh, one of the towns over the uh, rural because we, if you take the whole district budget, the rural communities are, are paying over 50 50 percent. They're paying about 51 51 and a half percent, and yet. Um, we look at the actual uh, development charges and that, that we were we wanted mm -hmm. to go up. Now, it was an interesting thing because in the paper uh, that that came up that if anybody wanted to take it to LPAT, they could. I'm hoping, and people have, have uh, talked to me about it, maybe one of the organizations like the, the Muskoka Ratepayers mm -hmm. or the MLA or something like that will go to LPAT because the district staff had recommended it going up mm -hmm. and we paid probably sixty thousand dollars on that and it was voted down anyway so uh, every time there's a, a, a house built in Huntsville we're paying 37 percent of the of the shortfall mm -hmm. 
of, of that house, and it's about if it's a, uh, it's about twelve thousand dollars. So if, if you're looking at a million dollars, every million dollars that, that, that is given to the developers to in, in, increase it, we have ratepayers fighting all these subdivisions, and now when they lose, they're actually paying. And that, and I don't think that's right. And I, I'm hoping somebody somewhere will will, will take this to LPAT. Uh, I don't believe we can because uh, and that, but I think there are are people out there that may take it to LPAT, and I'm hoping that they they do. It may just wake everybody up and saying, "Hey, let's make it fair," and that so. I'm just going to go around the room for a second. Thank you, seven. Chair. <laughs> through you, Again. so uh, I think I would certainly agree with uh, uh, <coughs> Councillor that. What we need to look at is uh, the comprehension of what the scope is. So let's keep it in the township for the moment. But I wonder if, if I could to uh, Councillor Jaglowitz that uh, is it as important, and I don't want to use the word serve notice, but I can't think of a better word, to let the district know that we are enacting this. And I think we as a township are looking into it. So we've we've asked staff for a report on the breakdown and I, I, I mean just as a as a matter of fact let them know that this is something we're doing well we haven't asked staff for any report yet we haven't <laughs> moved anything forward here and, and again um, I, I would be reluctant or be hard-pressed to say we want to put a resolution on the table today without notice we need two-thirds to have staff to make any kind of formal recommendations I think we're having a brief discussion that Councillor Jaglitz has brought up as to where he's going to go in the next week or two weeks so Councillor Mazan uh, thank you through you uh, first of all I appreciate you bringing this forward Frank and uh, I'm listening to those district councillors quite closely uh, even if I don't respond every time Councillor Nishikawa I am listening um, and I do think I'm looking at a report that we haven't actually gone through yet, but the strategic plan um, document, it does have a, a point here just that that is a, a big consideration for the township is the, the, exactly what you're talking about. I like the idea that Councillor Roberts has brought up but that there should be some kind of a formalized group that allows us to understand it as a whole so that we can approach things as a unified voice. Um, and actually do it in the appropriate manner. I, I would worry about us uh, with a knee jerk not having all the information, maybe doing ourselves a disservice if we do something too quickly out of the gate without having that um, very good kind of thought up front. So. Okay. Councilor Kelly, did you want to chime in on this right now? Or are you uh, okay? <laughs> Don't feel the need. No. <laughs> Always feel the need. Uh, it's kind of the Venturi effect. Uh, but <laughs> Um, yeah, I did get sucked into it. <laughs> Just a couple of thoughts. I, I, I think we need to have this discussion. I can tell you from my past, allocation of expenses between competing interests is, is it's not impossible, but it is impossible to make everybody happy. So somebody's going to feel a pinch, whether they like it or not. Um, I, I would love to have this conversation. I did not, unfortunately, uh, I don't appear to have received uh, Councillor Jagowitz's um, uh, was it Boxing Day missive, so I don't really ha haven't had a chance to digest that. I think we need to get this on the table. We need to make a full and complete discussion about it. My only concern is we're wasting our breath and wasting our time trying to find the correct allocation if at the same time we aren't making sure that the structure of the municipal governance in the District of Muskoka, including the Township of Muskoka Lakes, and all of the associated costs aren't being managed under a microscope. We've got to make sure uh, that whatever it is we're allocating is is as is, is, is minimized as we can possibly get away with. No fat in the system, uh, nobody looking the wrong way on approving expenses, uh, nobody buying uh, and satisfying ego needs by buying more equipment than they'll ever use. I, I, I trust that we have people of like mind you know, overseeing the expenditure side, but we've got to put as much emphasis and focus on is this the correct structure how do we streamline how do we reduce how do we consolidate how do we share how do we get away with less um, before we start figuring out who has to pay it uh, pay for it Councillor Hayes uh, 
being that I've been living full time in the township in Mus Muskoka since the 70s, this is not a new idea. Um, since 72? Since, yeah, since 71, actually. No, I meant for the district. Oh, school. yeah. <laughs> okay. But there is a disproportionate um, amount of voting at the level of government at the district. And in order to make any changes that we're contemplating, they have to get two-thirds of a vote that we don't the, the rural areas, the townships, do not have two-thirds of a vote of. Um, to make any change at all, it has to go through district. New programs have come on, like the computerized program when it came on in the 72, 73. Um, it was pay, pay per user. So if you had so many users, that's what you paid. And that was a good way to allocate funds because you paid for the service that you were requesting. Other services don't. If we could say, if we could get a breakdown of what are our paramedic services out here? What do they really serve? How much does it cost us? And then say, okay, we'll allocate that onto our tax bill at our assessment rate. Um, it would be much less than what it is right now. But that's something that's dictated by the district, just like the um, policing. And they have the option to allow us to pay our share. But when it requires district council to vote on that, the majority will always go in favor of the towns. So we can talk about this all we want, but I don't think it's ever going to get anywhere, unfortunately. I wish it would, but I don't think it will. Thank you to you. Um, I think that there's a higher authority. So if we document our, our case properly, then we go to the upper levels uh, and say, and, and, and they just went through a huge exercise of regional government. I think they did open the door up there for this kind of conversation. So I think we shouldn't be concerned with taking it over and above the district. I, I think I'm, it's sort of a request to uh, councillors that are not on district um, to see if you can make it out to district to a committee meeting, for instance. Um, you know, I started doing that when I was back in 2005 in that because there were things that were being impacted in in Muskoka Lakes that weren't, weren't, weren't really fully discussed at the council level because, in fact, it's a, dis a district dis decision, right? But it had impact and I didn't understand. So I tried to educate myself by attending some of those meetings. And unless you attend those meetings, you really don't get a full feel for what the discussion is or, um, or even, you know, how people decided at the end, right? And, or even to view that, you know, 10 councillors voted one way and nine voted another and why did that happen? I mean, that's, that's the important thing when we talk about development charges that way. Um, so I would really ask if you could try to make an attempt to, it's watching it on TV, by the way, doesn't give you very much um, feel for, for the environment and, and also it doesn't really look at the reactions from the other people around, uh, sitting around um, watching the things. So that's all I'm going to suggest is that if we're going to move these discussions further forward, it's a better understanding of our local councillors to really get even what our frustrations are rather than, because I, I don't voice things properly, I believe. Um, no, but I, I would say that's my, my opinion. It may not be Glenn's opinion is, is all I'm saying. So that's why I thought it'd be better if you could at least ten once or twice a year is all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
uh, I'd like to just add some of my comments to what I heard, and what I heard I thought was very good and, and, and positive. The first thing I heard was that I shouldn't be sending out a memo uh, to councillors. Uh, I actually didn't. The mayor sent around a Christmas greeting to all of us. I responded to the mayor and his Christmas greeting and just used the same list he used to send it out. And maybe that's why you didn't get it, Councillor Kelly, because it was actually a... You were not on the naughty list. Yes. I got it. By the way, I did, not get a, I did not get a response from the mayor, which is very unusual. Um, so, Councillor Jaglis, let me just be very specific. Whether I send out a Merry Christmas to all of Council, which is entitled, yeah. when you send out, uh, I'm going to do this, is advancing the business. Merry Christmas is not advancing the business of this corporation. Replying and using that list is not a get out of jail free card, so to speak. So let me just be very clear. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that clarification. Now, the second thing that I heard was Councillor Roberts indicated that it might be good to form a committee so that some, some councillor doesn't go off on a wild goose chase. I think that's an excellent idea, and I think the, the composition of the committee is, is up to this group. And it should not only look into where the problems are, but it should look at solutions also, I believe. Okay? Uh, as it's, as uh, Councillor Hayes mentioned, we're fighting an uphill battle there. We understand it. But we're, we, we, as the mayor indicated in his Christmas email, we're no longer rookies here. So I think we should do something. The second thing is that, um, and, and this is response to uh, Councillor Kelly, that I agree. But I, what I'm asking the district to do is reduce our share by 5%. Now, they can do it by, by reducing what we pay, or they can reduce the budget by 5%, which is only $5 million of the close to $100 million budget. So I think it's important. I, I'm on that committee, and this is me personally, asking the district to stop taxing us, tax us less. Um, as far as... Uh, Another item that I don't know if you're aware, but the, the committee that's being formed at the districts, the Modernization Committee, is going to be funded by the province. When they abandoned the uh, top-down approach to regional government, they made funds available for municipalities to consider things. That funding is available to us as a, as a municipality also, and I think our staff should look into it, and possibly we should be doing our own research as to how we can improve our situation for our taxpayers. And that, that I see as all part of it, uh, how, the, how maybe services should, should, should be realigned. Um, <coughs> and now I've got uh, one other note, and I, and, and I can't recall it, but I just want to uh, indicate that I, I'm not speaking for council. When I speak next week, I'll be speaking on myself. It would be nice if I could say that my council has listened to what I've said and they have decided possibly to investigate it. And the reason I want to uh, let the other councillors know, because I assume we'll be turned down. I assume that through this budget process, uh, we will get no breaks at all. And, but I just want to make it clear up front that we're hurting here and we're asking. And if, if that's the approach they want to take and they're going to put the, dig their heels in the sand, then I think we go to phase two. Is there something else we can do about it? But I, I thank you all for listening, and I hope you support Councillor Roberts' suggestion. Okay, I, I want to end this briefly as we move on, because we don't have a resolution on the table. Um, I, I don't believe that uh, Councillor Jagowitz can speak on behalf of Council at District. You're welcome to speak on behalf of yourself, and uh, that is fine as a District Councillor. Um, I will comment, just to circle back on a few things. Councillor Roberts said, you know, modernization, uh, or the regional review has opened the door for this. Um, this council, this municipality in the past, has identified areas that are unfair. OPP billing. Our administration spent a lot of money <coughs> hiring consultants, evaluating, saying this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. The approach to district at the time oftentimes was at the 11th hour sitting in a meeting saying, I'm not avoiding, I want something different. And guess what? It fell flat. Nothing, nothing has happened. <coughs> Effective change is going to come, not from what we want, because I don't think there's, we, we could sit around here, we want a better fairness in taxes. That unanimous <coughs> consent. 
The approach to that is going to have to be, in my opinion, in my nine years, ten years sitting around the table, a collective working with our fellow district councillors. That's what this new modernization committee that Chair Clink has set up is approached to do. How do we deal with this? Already had conversations with other mayors, which includes Huntsville, by the way, and Bracebridge, that at a high level say, yes, there are some inequities and we can do a better job. So working towards that, and I can only, Councillor Nishikawa was around the district table and Councillor Edwards at the time, nine years ago, ten years ago, when we had solid waste and Township Muskoka Lakes was going to be hit with about another million dollars worth of solid waste costs because of some discussions. And we could have fought it and put up our hands, but we actually worked with a committee at the district, sort of like this modernization committee, saying how do we, in fairness, deal with solid waste? And guess what? Our taxes did not go up. But I will say, and, and as much as I point a finger that you're taking too much money, and, and I'm very cognizant of this, when we open Pandora's box a little bit, because we have some significant inequities resident to resident, <coughs> and maybe I don't want my street plowed. There's only one person on my entire street that uses it year-round, and I don't want it done, and I'm going to get my neighbors together, and we want it stopped, and sorry, but there's certain levels of service that we all survive and live with. I don't believe there's a person sitting around this table that hasn't gone to the Bracebridge Sportsplex, or hasn't gone to the movies in Bracebridge, or hasn't gone to one of the other stores and in infrastructure that a town offers us. It does cost some money to use that, so I, I get the inequities that go on. Is the needle too far this way? Yes. Do we need to push it back 100% because Again, Pandora's box. Hey, you want to pay for just the services you take? Guess what? You want to come use our, our sportsplex? We're charging your non-resident. You're going to pay $100 or whatever the cost may be. So I, I, I don't disagree, Frank, with you commenting and, and trying to lobby that at uh, district. Personally, I wouldn't support it at this particular point. I think there's a different method in and a working together to find, with this modernization committee, a better approach funding formula between the district so um, that's my perspective and uh, we can uh, you know address this I'd be interesting to see what happens at uh, district with, with your comments and uh, we can continue this dialogue going forward one final comment and then we're going to uh, move on to the next item of business yes I'd like you to consider allowing uh, Councillor Roberts to bring up his uh, his uh, suggestion under new business and, and, and he can do that capably himself. Would you allow that to occur, Mr. Mayor? So technically on our council agenda, we don't have new business, but you're more than welcome to bring that up to a, uh, one of the subcommittees uh, as an idea. And again, I, I will just state, as clear as I can say this, we have unanimous consent around this table that op let's just pick OPP billing, that it's wrong. We, we have report after report after report, but affecting that change is going to be done at the district level no matter what resolution we pass, no matter what we do, we can sit in a committee and say wrong, 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 wrong. It's going to have to be top down. And hence the reason the province tried to do it, said, no, we're going to let you guys figure it out. And I think that's what Chair Clink is trying to do right now. So I, I'm very interested personally in seeing where that goes. But if Councillor Roberts wants to bring something up under a committee structure of new business, we're happy to vet it at that particular point. One last comment from a district councillor. I, I, I want to uh, clarify my role as a district councillor. I am a district councillor. Uh, when I'm in district chambers and dealing with district business, I have to care just as much about Huntsville that I do Muskoka Lakes. And I, I have to make that very clear that that is our role as district councillors when we're sitting around the table. So when we're discussing Fairburn, for instance, um, and, and mostly I would say that I, I, I don't put my public views out there. I, I know what my views are from the constituents of Muskoka Lakes um, generally, and it's usually about dollars, right? So yes, I bring that forward. But I also have to look at what is the betterment of the district, because that is my role as a district councillor. And I just want to make that very clear that so some of the decisions may look like they might not just benefit Muskoka Lakes or, or 
But I have to look at what is the overall benefit. And when you sit on community services for eight years and you see the hardships throughout the community and 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 the importance of us all coming together to try to uh, deal with some of those situations, again, look at how you wear your hat and, and what you were elected for is, is all I'm going to suggest. Okay. Um, I'm going to continue on with my report, which is Public Works. And... Uh, uh, we met on December 18th. Um, the first topic we had was that of recycling materials. We've authorized a one-year extension. Um, the cost of recycling is astronomical. It costs us $249 a tone to pick up and distribute and manage recycling. Just as a perspective, when we put it into the landfill, it's $180. So, so at the district, we, we, as opposed to, they wanted a multi-year extension. We have said no. We've agreed to actually build uh, at Rose Warren an area that we can actually store some materials short term that gives us an opportunity to look at some other suppliers that may help. We've been somewhat handcuffed because the recycling uh, supplier is the only one with storage facilities on our behalf. So we're looking at alternatives and we are not sitting down and accepting this as a cost. Three years from now, um, the province is into uh, a whole new recyclable perspective um, and that the producers are supposed to be paying for it. Exactly what and how that looks is going to be an interesting perspective. Next area we talked about was our bin sites. That is coming to committee next week. Um, we did, I think I mentioned last month, that we got a moratorium, so to speak, on removal. Um, there are still, uh, met with the MLA, and uh, some other key stakeholders of other cottager associations um, in December on bin sites, there are some that are still problematic, that they cannot resolve, that are too close to the water, that are leaking, that are things. So we're going to be working with those people to find alternatives and short-term alternatives. Uh, it may be that we bring in some bins for two days a week, and then they're gone. So those are your garbage days. You can drop it off, and otherwise you've got to keep it yourself. Um, but there are probably eight that are high, high, high risk out of the total 95 that may have to come out this spring, but that will all be coming to our committee um, or an initial report this coming week. So if you can come, it would be very interesting, as Councillor Shikawa says, or tune in on webcast. But uh, that's uh, still issues. Updates, some water treatment plant stuff, looking at treatments, and just regular award of contracts, nothing exciting. Um, and really, that was it. So um, we are uh, moving forward, but uh, bin site is key and a problematic that we're going to have to be addressing. Um, more information now, and then in the next couple months, there will be even more information on what sites may have to come out and what mitigation measures can be uh, implemented to help. So any comments, questions? Councilman Zan. Thank you, through you. Just for clarification on that, the eight potential sites, are, are they known sites? Are these? We have not released yet because of <laughs> concerns. Um, I mean, we know the 95 sites that are across the district. Um, there were some that were problematic, but the actual report with X landing site has not been released at this point because we try not to send panic, and we also want to make sure we have some uh, solutions in place and some next steps before we send panic through the community at this point. So, Councillor Hayes. Um, well, we all know in the news, uh, Foodland in one of the uh, southern towns has decided to stop using all plastic bags. Today, gone. Okay. Um, hooray for them. That's a, that's a good step. Has the district looked at doing anything to, rather than to have to deal with the recycling, to reduce it? Do we have any firm plans, firm ideas, uh, single-use plastic? Uh, are we going ahead with anything like that? So we have a committee uh, at Rose Warren, uh, which is the landfill. There's a public. Reducing uh, landfill. So they would be dealing with this at this particular time and advising. Um, one member is just removed from there, and I've actually recommended that uh, the MLA um, join that committee 
because they have a vested interest, obviously, across the district at what goes in there. So um, they would be advising. We don't have any specific plans. We are looking at, and we discussed it before Christmas with budget, our committee will be looking at certain things like bike bag limit reductions. Um, and, you know, I, I'll be honest, where we protect Muskoka Lakes, right now we're allowed three bags a week. District says, well, we're going to change that to two, two, two bags a week. That's great, but for the seasonal resident, they get double impacted. So I don't have an issue if we go from 156 bags a year, three bags a week, down to 104 bags a year. Might actually help our seasonal residents that allow them to some days put out four bags during the week if we did a bag tag system. So that's kind of the, the net result annualized is the same, but it may help our seasonal residents going forward. Council Roberts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I sure hope, I mean, we, we attended sessions put on by the district on waste management, and they, many of them. And um, I sure hope because and clear bags, well. yeah, because it'll tell you whether you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I am ready now. <laughs> now, actually, <laughs> it was a very, very dull meeting compared to all the other ones by the sounds of it. <laughs> so bore us. Um, there was the Ontario Special Advisor on the flooding report, which we, we have here. And there was a flood last year, they, 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 and that, but it was Mother Nature that did it, so nobody's at fault. Oh, and. Um, of course, we were asked about this climate emergency that some municipalities are, are uh, putting out. But we decided to wait for the report because we have a, uh, a person on staff that's looking into the environment and that. So uh, there will be something coming down either in June or uh, July, then we'll make a, a decision. I mean, there's no use saying it's a, it's a climate emergency. Everybody knows there's, there's changes, but unless you've got something working towards it. Um, there was just a brief update on the housing uh, task force working group. And then uh, there was uh, a plan of subdivision uh, was deemed complete, and that's Muskoka Trail subdivision in, in uh, Port Carling. And that, and uh, there was another one for Huntsville, so. And uh, let's see what else. And it was just uh, entering into a, uh, a service agreement with a third party uh, service provider for, uh, for uh, child care. And of course, they're entering into a funding uh, arrangement for delivery of child care programs and, and, and that. Uh, rental supplements, there was a report on that. Um, and uh, there was one again just on uh, on housing and that. Um, and what was the other one? And just a, a, a brief outline on uh, on uh, community services. And um, there will be as uh, and that is it basically. So it was very very. Uh, and that mundane, other than, like I say, and it was just a, the, the report on the subdivision in, in Port Carlingwood, just it's, it's, it's final, that's all. So they haven't even, even come forward. Okay. Any comments, questions? Okay. Uh, community updates. Anybody comment? Mr. Kelly. February, now I've lost the date, February the 7th, I think it is the weekend, is Winterfest in Port Carling. Uh, and if you haven't been, it is a lot of fun. Uh, runs through the entire weekend. Uh, they close Bailey Street uh, to, <clears throat> to traffic, to most traffic. Um, fireworks Friday night. Anyhow, if, if, you, if you're here and you get an opportunity, it really is a lot of fun. I'll go around the room. Councillor Hayes. Um, 
Tuesday, January 28th is the uh, community potluck. Everybody's welcome. Bring your own utensils. Uh, the library winter hours are on now. It's Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday from noon until 3. Uh, we have yoga Tuesdays at 1.30. Uh, we have quilting Wednesdays from 1 to 4. And pickleball, I believe, is the first two Tuesdays of the month from 9 until noon. Everybody's welcome to join in any of these activities. Wonderful. Moving around. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just speaking of pickleball, um, Milford Bay is the pickleball uh, capital of Muskoka Lakes. Uh, I'm not kidding. Yeah, tough of fame. Well, our, for the winter. Yeah, our, the, our, no, well, yeah, yeah, for the winter. You were. <laughs> Anyways, at Christmas, over Christmas, there was 20, 20, 30 people Christmas Day playing pickleball. So it's alive and well. And then as my true call, my colleague beside me, um, it does transfer into our arenas, in, in, uh, in the, but it is just booming in the Muffer Bay Community Center. Councilor Shikawa. Thank you. I, I mostly wanted to, well, no, I'm going to just comment. So with Winterfest in Port Carling, is the mayor going to do the polar bear dip this year? <laughs> just saying. But <laughs> the mayor's response would be the same as it was last year. Um, <laughs> no. You've had your children. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, the mayor likes warm water. <laughs> the, the other, uh, no, um, so those of you that may or may not be aware, uh, Glen Orchard Public School is again doing an exchange program that, uh, this has been going on for years, uh, but they are doing some fundraising for that, and so if there's ever and an opportunity for uh, those to, to give, it would be great. Um, the and the Battle Legion will be holding a concert on January 25th, big band concert, and some of the, those funds um, will also go towards uh, that uh, child's program. Councilor Bridgman. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a community update, but I thought I would let you know on the waste management part of it that uh, I'm sitting on the AMO Waste Management Task Force. So I will report back to you when we've had our meetings on, on that. Awesome. Councillor Roberts, anything? Councillor Zavitz, Councillor Mazan. I am, uh, thank you, three of you. Uh, I am thrilled to say that Hecla is having its second community event at their hall. I actually am thrilled to say this. Uh, so next Wednesday, January the 23rd at 6 p.m., uh, if anybody in that area is interested, they're having their first potluck. Please bring your own cutlery um, and dishes, actually, not just cutlery. We don't have much up and <laughs> pretty much bring everything. <laughs> bring your food, dishes, and cutlery. But uh, I, I just to, to finish off that statement, this is a chance to get to know all of your neighbors and build a real community. And I think that's a lot about what we're trying to do here. So, Awesome. Thank you. That is next Wednesday, January the 23rd at 6 p.m. Thank you. I am. Okay. Um, okay. Let's continue to move on. We've got a number of management, uh, senior management reports on some surplus land, uh, items A, B, and C, and then also some committee appointments. Uh, I'm going to group the four of those together and ask uh, Council if there's any questions on those, and seeing if there is none, well, I would just read the bylaws. Any comments on those first three? Surplus land declarations or committee appointments? Madam Clerk, I don't see anything. Uh, they were included in a closed session report. Yep. Oh, yeah. We have to discuss that later. Okay. So uh, the, the committee appointments have been vetted uh, by the committee chairs, the subcommittee chairs as well. So. Don't look at me. <laughs> any, any changes to them, let me say. Correct? So can I get some resolutions? Let's do surplus lands. Yeah. Pardon me? Oh, we'll do them in the, okay, so don't know any comments, just read the bylaws. Um, let's go to section E, and I think there might be some discussion on this, uh, and that's a report from uh, Mr. Becking regarding uh, pre-2020 capital budget approval to buy a new Eagle sweeper. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my comments uh, that follow are uh, apply to both the two uh, reports, so 
I'll, uh, I'll summarize and then uh, if there are any questions. Um, firstly, I'd like you to know that I didn't bring these reports forward lightly. Um, we are in an unusual situation and uh, we are facing uh, some delays in the budgetary process which will have a operational impact. So um, please understand that uh, I, I understand that this is unusual. Um, the current machines in both instances are beyond their, the end of their useful lives. Um, uh, we are finding that they're broken down more than they're operating and uh, they're costing us an inordinate amount of money to to keep them on the road. Um, both of the machines are required in the early spring to do um, regular routine maintenance that the public uh, will expect. Um, without them, we will be significantly delayed as a result of, of uh, a lack of resources. Um, with the delay in the budget, um, we may not see, depending on the timing of the budget, we may not see uh, replacements for these two pieces of equipment until midsummer, uh, as an early date, uh, if we were to go forward with a conventional uh, procurement process. So um, there are some, some timelines that we, uh, we are facing here. Um, uh, I am aware that uh, the uh, previous capital work forecasts did allow approximately $500,000 uh, per year in the next few years for equipment purchases. I don't have the specific details of what was included in those. Um, as you can see from the two reports, uh, the, uh, the proposed purchases are, uh, are more than the, the sums that were to be allocated. Um, I would suggest that, that the sums that were in previous forecasts were likely light, and actually I, I uh, did express those views last year when, when we dealt with budget. Um, the cost of new, uh, new equipment is up significantly from previous years. Uh, that can generally be attributed to the cost of increased cost of inputs, particularly steel. Uh, which uh, can chase itself back to uh, certain trade disagreements between ourselves and our neighbors to the south, um, as well as uh, dynamics that are going on within the, the global market. Um, Points, Your Worship, and then I'll uh, thank you. I'll uh, speak uh, open to questions. Uh, we did consider alternatives, both renting and leasing. Um, obviously, those are possible, uh, but they come at a, at a significant cost. Um, they they're going to hurt in the short term, and they will hurt in the long term. So they're not they're not, uh, in my view, a viable option, but they are an option nonetheless. Um, Staff have attempted to, to mitigate uh, the circumstances that we're facing uh, by examining uh, purchasing used equipment. As a general statement of principle, I don't recommend it. But on some of our larger pieces of equipment where you can find a um, piece of equipment with low hours uh, and gentle use, uh, they can be a viable alternative and pro provide the municipality with good value. So uh, we have sourced uh, two pieces of equipment that I feel f fit that category. Um, on the caveat, however, that any agreement to purchase those pieces of equipment were subject to the, the ratification of this council and that the, uh, the leading mechanic uh, goes through them with a fine tooth comb and is satisfied that we're not getting stuck with a with a uh, a lemon. Um, finally, your worship, uh, funds are available in the uh, working capital reserve um, to to pay for these purchases uh, up front. Um, one purchase would take place before the end of the month. The other one will not take place until the first of April. S again, subject to your approval. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll turn it over to uh, Council for. Uh,
probably more of an oxymoron than anything else, but uh, I'll go down the line. Councillor uh, Jagowitz, first of all, then Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I'm not going to address why these are being purchased. That's out of my, uh, my, my expertise, so I'll, I'll accept that, that they are good purchases. But what I like, would like to do is address how they're being paid for. As I read the resolution, uh, they're being paid out of the working capital reserve. And um, I, I don't think that's appropriate. I think they should be paid for out of the roads budget, which means that yeah, I assume there's a roads uh, or public works reserve. And I'm just wondering why they're not being paid out of there. Um, and you're correct. There's 498,000 in the last capital forecast <coughs> budget we passed. We only passed one year, but then we had another nine years. It was semi-passed, and there is 498,000 there. These purchases total 682. We don't have a financial statement. We don't know where we are. I have real trouble with this concept, but I also have heard the arguments as to why we should do it now, and, and so I'll accept that. I just think the motion should be uh, uh, changed so that these are paid for out of the public works budget reserve and or whatever. And if there has to be some interim financing out of the working capital reserve, that it then be put back when the budget is passed. And, and part of the reason I mention that is that, I don't know if you're all aware, with the fire budget that's come to us in the past, it's had maybe $15,000 for putting into the reserve and a million dollars going out. And I just think we have to stop that. So, so uh, uh, Mr. Becking will have to come forward with a budget that, that includes these, uh, in, in my view. But so, I certainly, yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. Becking. I, I just a question. I, I don't believe we have specific department by department capital budget reserves. I think it's one capital reserve. Am I wrong? Or maybe you can advise accordingly. Your Worship, uh, you're correct. Um, I, I would, a discussion for another day, but I would advocate that we should be changing how we deal with capital equipment. But as I say, that's a discussion for another day. As it relates specifically to the councillor's comments, um, he is correct. It should the purchases should come out of um, any allo funds allocated by council for public works, um, and uh, certainly any budget that I bring forward to you later this year will in fact have these purchases included under the heading of public works. Um, my comment was simply that we currently have cash in hand um, in a reserve that can be utilized, subject to your permission. To, to fund the uh, immediate cost of the purchases. Okay, just a, a point of clarification. Without our treasurer here, maybe the CAO can answer or yourself would know. In the past, if we've had surpluses or put away money in our public works budget into reserves, this is the reserve fund that the money's gone into. So we're not taking money from another department. It's we, capital or public works has put money into working in capital reserve and we're taking money out of working capital reserve. So I think the fund is appropriate at this time, but I agree we can do some different funding. Councillor Jago, is a supplemental? Just a supplemental. I, I have no problem with that as long as they're earmarked as public work funds. And so when it shows up, we, we'll see that those monies have been, because we have to stop that lump sum reserve. And we have to stop it at this budget. Councillor Roberts? Thank you. I'll throw you. I, I'm, I, I leave it to... Um, Mr. Becking and his expertise and experience on whether this is a good pit purchase or what to do. I, I, the only part I was concerned with how we were going to pay for it, and um, and in the reserve does have some money. I understood, just was informed that was put in there by Public Works. But I think this should be, uh, I don't, and I don't totally understand the whole process. But if he's, we're taking out 600k. Um, to, to pay these, then Public Works budget next year should be putting 600 k back in to the reserve. And uh, it's, uh, that's an, or else I, I, I don't know whether I can support this. Right, so just a, a, as a point of reference, again, we evenly fund because we don't have to buy $600,000 and $900,000 every year. So just because it comes out doesn't mean we put a matching number back in. The idea being we put away $300,000 into reserves. One year we take out a million, one year we take out $100,000, and that's how we level the tax base. That's the concept between money going behind reserves. So, Councillor Nishikawa? My only question uh, was what we do with the old equipment. And is there. Uh, Director yeah. Becking? Your Worship, the uh, township policy is that it be. Uh, 
put out to auction and it will be uh, sold off to the highest bidder. And those monies come back into our reserves as well. So that is correct. It's a no. credit. Thank you, Councillor Zavitt. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Through you to uh, Director Becking. Um, so will we be contemplating in budget as a council uh, other proposals coming forward from you for other capital expenditures, other equipment? You're going to be coming to us with a $900,000 or whatever, or do you, do you believe that this Mm -hmm. um, the draft budget that I brought forward envisages uh, two other purchases that are under $100,000, I believe. Um, um, as I said, um, both of these pieces of equipment, there's no question that the, there is a need for their replacement. They are, are long in the tooth. Um, we've, uh, we've tried to mitigate the expense to the extent that we possibly can, given global dynamics that are going on, um, and we're uh, we're trying to be as economical as we can possibly be. Okay. Councillor Roberts. Uh, yeah, I just looking at the first one here that, that we can save about one hundred thirty-one thousand dollars, and that by buying a, a used sweeper. And as far as I'm concerned, I think we should go ahead and uh, purchase them. Uh, the public works need both of them, and that take them under reserves. And uh, Mr. Becking can uh, put it in his uh, budget, and uh, we can go from there. Because if they're needed and you can get used at, at a uh, good uh, price, and they're they're well worth it, it's well worth it. So I would support this 100 percent. Okay. Is there anybody has a comment that's not in support at this time? You have a specific question? Okay. Thank you. Through you, um, do we do all our own maintenance and service on this stuff in house, or most of it? That's correct. Your, your Worship, we have two mechanics on staff, and yes, we do do the lion's share, except for some very unique or specific items. Okay, I have a resolution I'm going to read, moved by Councillor Everett, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Be a resolved Township Council authorize a pre budget approval uh, for the purchase of one 2017 Freightliner Elgin Street sweeper in the amount of $269,000 plus HST with funds to be allocated from the Working Capital Reserve account as per the January 15, 2020 staff report. And the, the Township Council grant relief from the Township Procurement Policy CAO, CCAO 13 for the non competitive purchase. And further, that the Director of Public Works be authorized to execute. That is carried. I have one more because we kind of lumped these two together. Moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved the Township Council authorized pre budget approval for the purchase of one 2018 John Deere 770 GP greater in the amount of 335000 plus HST with funds to be allocated from the Working Capital Reserve account as per the January 15, 2020 staff report. And the Township Council grant relief from the Township Procedure Procurement Policy CCAO 13 for non competitive purchase. And further, that the Director of Public Works be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with the purchase. Any comments on the greater? All those in favor? That is carried. Perfect. Those two are done. Uh, we need to battle fall. Oh, no. Let's go to uh, environmental assessment. Anybody have any questions on the environmental assessment for, uh, before the director makes any comments? I think we're okay. Item G, 8G. We have a uh, award um, for an environmental assessment on Burgess 1 Dam. Any comments? I'm going to read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Everts. Be resolved, Township Council authorize a pre-budget approval and award the assignment for the completion of Burgess 1 Dam environmental assessment to the firm Tulik Engineering Limited in the amount of $83,361 plus HST with funds to be allocated in the 2020 capital budget. Uh, and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with the project. Any comments? Any momentum? All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Okay, I got one more of those. Valley Falls Bridge, the environmental work. Moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be a resolved Township Council authorize the pre budget approval to award the assessment, um, sorry, the assignment for the completion of the Valley Falls Bridge class environmental assessment uh, to the firm. Uh, of Tatham Engineering Limited in the amount of $43,468 plus HST with funds to be allocated in the 2020 capital budget and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with the project. Any comments, questions? All those in favor? 
That is carried. Thank you. So, Bell Falls there. Uh, Moon River Dock. Um, got a report and a tender. Any questions on that report? I'm going to read the resolutions moved by Councillor Roberts. Huge amount of money. That's all. Well, so, no, but we, so it is, and we're rejecting it, is the bottom line. Right? It's too much money. We're going back. So we're saying no at this time. So moved by Councillor Roberts, second by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved, Township Council reject the tender bid from uh, FACA Inc. respecting the reconstruction of the Moon River Dock and the staff be directed to retender the contract for the reconstruction of the Moon River Dock. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Moon River's done. Uh, Public Works Fire Chief. Uh, Chief Morrell, do you want to provide a quick overview on this for us? Oh, I'll take the lead on this one. Okay. Um, um, so, uh, as Council has requested, uh, uh, staff have reviewed the uh, report from the Special uh, Advisor uh, to the province with respect to the flooding. <coughs> um, uh, no surprise, we had a flood. So did everybody else across the province. Um, the province's uh, assertion was that the flooding experienced was as a result of uh, generally a quick snow melt in combination with heavy rains. Um, and there were uh, numerous ac accusations of uh, perhaps uh, uh, an alternate view. Um, the province hired uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Douglas McNeil, uh, who is an engineer from Manitoba and is responsible for the a lot of the flood-related activities in, in Manitoba with respect to the Red and Cinnaboyne Rivers. Um, and uh, his mandate was to um, look at roles and responsibilities throughout the province, uh, communications with public and stakeholders, the legislative and regulatory framework, uh, approaches to mitigation, and improvements uh, for community resilience. Um, he went away in July, came back in the end of October with his report, which includes 66 recommendations. Um, generally speaking, the ma majority of those recommendations focus in three areas. One in terms of prevention, um, uh, one in, in terms of emergency preparedness and, uh, and response to emergencies, and then uh, eight recommendations with respect to uh, emergency recovery. Um, I will take, I'll speak to some of the public works related issues and then uh, my colleagues, uh, the fire chief and the director of planning uh, will speak to uh, the recommendations as it relates to their own specific areas. Um, the three, I think, big uh, takeaways from my perspective, um, the uh, special advisor is suggesting that uh, a risk-based approach uh, to the management of flood-related matters is, is a, a desirable approach. He identified there's a hazard approach, which is essentially uh, you identify a hazard area or an area that's subject to, to flooding, and you don't allow anybody to do anything in that area, full stop. Um, that would be nice if we had a completely clean slate and we didn't have to worry about anything other than flooding. Um, the re life is never like that, and uh, so he's he suggested a risk-based approach where we look at uh, the fact that there is existing uh, activities within these hazard areas. We assess what the risk of uh, flooding is, and then we, we take measures uh, uh, frequently of which are, are uh, engineering in nature. Um, to mitigate that risk or minimize the impact uh, of, of a, an event on, uh, on the development and the activities that take place in those areas. Um, the second area uh, that the uh, Special Advisor focused on was the development of, of uh, improved uh, floodplain mapping. Um, I started my career when floodplain mapping was a, was a thing. Uh, in this province, um, and um, I can tell you that we've gone, we're head and shoulders above what the tools that we had when I started my career way back when. Um, and um, 
and we need to take advantage of that fact to better define what it is that we're dealing with. Um, and which leads me to my third point, which is uh, having an improved uh, predictive capability. Uh, to be honest with you, I was caught unawares uh, that this thing was coming down the pipe at me. Now, part of that's my own fault because I was new to the area and, and uh, I didn't understand the dynamics of whatnot. But uh, we should have should have had a far better and a far longer lead time to this, and. Um, and we didn't. And with the level of technology that we have at our disposal, uh, we should have seen this freight train coming. So those are my three points. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the Director of Planning uh, for his comments. Mr. Pink. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll just quickly touch on uh, Recommendation 22, uh, which was fairly noteworthy with respect to planning and development. Um, the report specifically mentions that cottages, docks, and boathouses continue to be built um, in floodplains and recommends the Ministry of Environment consider requesting uh and certainly in the township, docks and boathouses do continue to be built um, in the floodplains. Um, obviously a ministerial order uh, would have a considerable impact to the township of Skoka Lakes as we know uh, uh, we do permit docks and boathouses. It, uh, wouldn't or couldn't a uh, ministerial order address existing development, but it could prevent um, new. Um, and uh, I'll just note two things uh, that are, I believe, important to note. There is specific language in the Provincial Policy Statement PPS that I believe Muskoka advocated for uh, in a previous update uh, in Policy 314B, and it does state that uh, development may be permitted within floodways, that which by their very nature uh, are situated there, such as uh, docks and boathouses. So that language was included by the province. And also in the recently updated District of Muskoka Official Plan Policy I-25B, uh, it uh, doesn't imply, it explicitly states that docks and boathouses, amongst others, are permitted uh, in floodways, and that plan, district plans, are approved by the province of Ontario, and that was recently approved by the province of Ontario. So these recommendations would run a little counter uh, to that. Um, I would note also, uh, I believe it was the last term of council, but there was a, a very good debate on the uses of first story of boathouses that I believe was about a year uh, or so ago, and uh, planning committee, I believe it was, was fairly uh, torn or split uh, as to, uh, you know, permitting some habitable use in the first story of a boathouse. I think these recommendations and the flood that occurred and the previous before that really should resolve that debate and, uh, and answer that question. And lastly, I would just, uh, I guess, echo... Um, uh, the Director of Public Works comments on the floodplain mapping. The District of Muskoka is currently undertaking updated floodplain mapping. It should be released uh, imminently and it's excellent timing with respect to our official plan review and the intention is to include that mapping and related policy uh, through that process. So those are all my <coughs> comments. Happy to pass it to the Fire Chief. Chief Morrell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my comments will relate uh, specific to what the report suggested the Ontario <coughs> Government needed to do better in points 34 through 37, they, uh, the special advisor mentions that we should monitor the water better. Uh, this data was lacking during our flood and it was pointed out in my report that was uh, received by council earlier. It was also required to make, uh, this uh, information was required by us as an emergency control group to make informed decisions. Uh, specifically, this is data from monitors across the watershed. At times, uh, there are errors in this information. Uh, the advisor notes that this hydrometric, hydrometric network requires consistent stable funding, uh, which highlights the fact that perhaps this wasn't there already. Uh, he also mentions that an expansion of the monitors uh, with auto alarms would be recommended. Uh, we agree with this, and we also request that uh, redundant equipment be considered to allow for more accurate warning, and I'll be putting those pressures on my ministry counterparts to make sure that that occurs. We also believe that these tools should be public accessible on a web platform, which highlights the next point. Um, following on the above need for the increased monitors, the advisor also talks to a flood warning system that uses both forecasting models that merge real-time gauge data with weather radar to produce flood forecasts. Uh, we noted that this uh, needed to be improved upon by the Ontario Ministry, um, that is the Ministry of Natural Resources. These forecasts can produce the need for public alerts through the Alert Ready platform. 
that can geo-target those in flood-prone locations. Um, in complex water systems like ours, this can move the responsibility to the place where it currently lies, which is the MNRF, and have this organization provide the alerts publicly. Uh, the third point that I'll mention, and this is a big point that came across in my report and also in the Ontario Government report, improving communications in emergency management processes. These are points 43 through 46. The flood advisor comments on maintaining a focus on the continuous improvement initiatives in emergency management for Ontario. Uh, while I agree that these initiatives, and while we agree as a group that these initiatives in emergency management have been healthy for the program across Ontario, uh, they have been slow to adopt at all levels. Uh, specifically, the two-tiered model that exists today in the Muskoka District um, was identified as a pain point for both the upper and the lower tiers that required the same information support. So I'll explain this specifically. Uh, when you have an emergency control group, you have support contacts that you lean upon. So think of these like uh, utilities, OPG, the MNRF, uh, and EMS. It was noted uh, that improved information sharing would be beneficial in this capacity. We agree with the flood advisor recommendation of a shared website. Uh, further, we believe that there needs to be an increase in the use of technology through webinars and conference calls. This is uh, dissemination of the information and updated warnings to all the stakeholders would be best served on a provincially supported website and a conference call system similar to what is being done for wildfires in northern Ontario. Uh, for this group and through your worship's uh, information, I've had experience with that system. Uh, the MNRF does an excellent job when it comes to managing wildfires and providing information to emergency control groups from that standpoint. Um, these simple improvements can allow the lower tiers to participate with the upper tier ECGs on the same call. So imagine somebody from Hydro One not having to travel around to six municipalities for six different emergency control groups, but they could do so electronically one time and we all gather and then we take that same information back to our own um, control groups to make information to make that information available. Um, this can also eliminate confusion, misinformation, and the need to have contacts travel to multiple EOCs, as I mentioned. Any improvement in communication during emergency has been seen beneficial in all types of emergencies. And with that, I yield the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Council. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, and to you as Mayor, I'll have to read this because I just wrote it out. What should this council do with uh, the provincial report and the subsequent staff dissection of the same, given you are on record as not taking it anymore and have been in front of the top Ontario governmental officials in that regard? So the, the point, point being is that, you know, in support of you and all of your machinations over all the days while we experienced the flood, and now here we are, and you know the pictures with you with Doug Ford and everyone, and all the all the efforts that you you know admirable efforts that you put forward. Um, I'm left very confused by the provincial position, which is fine. Let's not lay blame, but um, here it comes again. Like I, I see nothing whatsoever in this report that um, affects me as a, a, a landowner on Lake Muskoka, which will flood again. Uh, nothing at all, and I don't see any narrative. I'm not hearing anything, and I'm connected with people. I'm here. There's nothing. It's it's crickets, and and I, I, I would ask you the question. Um, I I would tend to agree that the flood advisors report certainly doesn't provide any solutions, if you will, <laughs> and certainly not for short-term mitigation as to what we are going to deal with in four months. Um, and, and I will say I, I was very disappointed in the, in the report and I'll state that quite publicly uh, I've been disappointed in the MNRF in not responding we do have this new committee five million dollar committee not quite Steve Austin I don't know who's the six million dollar man and um, the uh, I, I'm, I'm cautious that they're going to get some answers moving forward but I do know because I have been in bi-weekly like twice a week contact with that committee 
and they're not getting all the answers that they want, and they're not getting all the data that they want from the various ministries to go forward. There is, I think we saw, I'm not sure if I just got, but there is a um, public meeting, I believe, on the 24th that that committee is soliciting some information, and uh, if you give us a second here, uh, we'll broadcast that. I think it's for, hmm? There was an email that came out, and I'm not sure if it came to staff or not. I, I saw it, and I'll look to our CIO on that. But but that's more input for them. They are on a next couple month timeline. The 23rd is the date. Um, they are on a next Thursday afternoon, I believe it is, 2 o'clock till 5. I'm pretty sure it's a public meeting. David? We'll, for Curling Community Center. So how does the public know? We, we will have to broadcast this to the public as best we can and again we're, we're listening to this committee it's their their mandate we're just responding to it but I'll, I'll, we'll get circle back to it um Derek your worship uh, again the date is uh, January 23rd 2 30 p.m. to 4 30 or 5 30 um, at the Port Carnan Community Center so the email was uh, sent to previous participants of the first listening session. This is a second listening session. The email contents of a, some kind of newspaper advertisement or text related to something like that. But certainly we can uh, forward that, uh, um, that um, email to uh, all of council. That just came in this, this morning. Yesterday, um, your municipal representatives, and again, we will forward that off. It literally has not even been in our inbox for 12 hours, so um, we're going to start to get it out there. I'm not sure how they are communicating that to the public or expecting us to do that, but that's that. So, it, circle back and answer your question. Um, we did request at the uh, Roma conference a delegation with the MNRF that was not uh, granted. Um, we uh, now need to change our game. The, the good news is um, that the three impacted municipalities that declared a state of emergency are more commonly working together. This report that, uh, that's come forward and is on the table with resolution has been discussed um, through all, or is being discussed at all three councils, I believe. I know that the CIOs have all had discussion and input into crafting this as a joint report. Um, and then, so there's some requests in here specifically that we have in our recommendation. And uh, I, I will be from a district perspective. We need a district response to visit Queen's Park. We need to uh, elicit more help from Norm Miller. And we need to start to get some answers to this in particular. Um, there's some short-term strategies. There's some long-term ideas. Um, I, I will comment the one thing that I believe will help all concerned um, and it's reported in this report so it's a recommendation that goes in here but and I agree with it is that over the last 10 years we need to take every lake above stream if you will that has a control structure and is included in the Muskoka River water management plan we need to identify and overlay that plan with where the actual water levels were for a period. I believe when we start to look at that, number one, we will be able to predict floods a little bit better because we will see it in the north and that they're above and that that bubble of water as such is coming down. And I do believe that what we are going to see, this is my 30,000 foot view, but we are going to notice that over the last decade that the high and low normal operating zone and then there's the target line, I think Councilor Jagowitz alluded to this, we are going to see that regularly we are on the middle to high part of that zone and we bounce above the normal operating zone regularly. We very rarely go down or below. Um, and I'll, I'll use, this could be a university student project that if we took every month, recorded a lake level data, map that out, and you color code that river system green or blue if it's on target. If it's above the zone and a, way above the top, it turns red, 
and it turns green on the very bottom side. And you'll start to see a wave of water that you could graphically, and I think this is where uh, Chief Morrell talks about an online interface that I could click and I see a bunch of red up top. We know that in five days that's coming to Muskoka Lakes. I think that that kind of data will also highlight some issues with the MRWMP. As much as we want to change the MRWMP, as much as we want to say lower water levels, and again, this new. As soon as we we're going to have algae blooms everywhere because stagnant water is not healthy it's not good for the environment so that's always the risk and if we don't get I'll say the spring runoff but as the season goes on so they're trying to look at both sides what are the impacts of being too high and there's negative impacts but what are the impacts of being too low and there's negative impacts we had a presentation from Swift River today, and I will again state this, and I'll state it very publicly. Follow the money. Ontario Power Generation for the province of Ontario last year put $1.1 billion into the province. So if we have to put in stop logs, and water's not moving through the system, it's going to affect their pocketbooks. Part of our resolutions that go back to 2016 have always been to identify the choke points. Remember we talked about we can now, we've eliminated somewhat of a choke point because we can move water through faster through Bala. That's going to compound a problem on the Moon River. But now let's take that data and say, hey, guess what, province? Great, you're already solving one of the problems. Now let's so solve the next problem a little further downstream. So there's a whole bunch of moving parts to this, but the one thing that I've noted, and um, I know the chair of this new uh, committee has noted, they're not always getting the answers from the province. And they can talk, oh yeah, well, we're on that, we're on that, and the answers don't come. So we can pass as many resolutions as we want, we can sit around here and we can talk ad nauseum. The answers are going to be at Queen's Park. We got some resolve last May when I had an opportunity to meet with the Premier a little bit. Um, we need to re-energize that and we need to start that process again but as all Gracebridge, Huntsville, Muskoka likes the three major effective, Gravenhurst as well. We tried to do it at the Roma conference, it didn't happen. I think it's going to have to be a one-on-one -on -one meeting at Queen's Park and uh, I had an opportunity last, one of the two uh, uh, township mayors were here on Thursday. They were here on Thursday. We had some discussions about this very thing as well. So um, I don't have a specific answer. Uh, I have stuck my neck out and said, uh, this is, we need to fix this. Can I guarantee at this point that spring of 2019 or 2020 is going to be perfect? No, I can't, with one exception, that I think all ministry eyes are going to be very cognizant about what's going on, uh, and now this is a Ford government problem, not a prior government problem. Glenn. Thank you to you. Uh, appreciate the candor, and I think um, our taxpaying residents need to hear this on the public, in a public forum. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I compliment you on that explanation. Uh, 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 that was very good. The one thing, though, that struck me was I didn't hear the word district when you said you said the three municipalities affected, and that, and I just wondered where is the district in this in this issue? So it will become a district issue, um, but as a starting point, we are working with the other most affected municipalities, and I may see I may chime in, and then we will have to bring this up to a resolution of district. But again, we, we have township resolutions, we have district resolutions, we have Bracebridge resolutions that all still fall flat. So this is going to be some affected municipalities bringing all of Muskoka involved to Queen's Park as best I can say. Derek? Your Worship, uh, I, I would uh, uh, direct counsel to the second part of the resolution or the recommendation and it does it does mention the district municipality of Muskoka with respect to advocacy as well as the other area municipalities. 
Um, I, I, if I could, I'd like to thank the staff team for preparing what I thought was an excellent report. Um, it, it was sent to the other CAOs, and I believe that that report will be the platform for their reporting to their councils, the other area municipalities. Um, so I, I, I think it, it, it needs to be said that uh, the staff team did a great job on this report. Thank you. And I will say this report, though not officially because we haven't ratified it yet, um, has also been sent to this new flood committee. Um, and later on today, once assuming we do approve this, uh, it will be circulated to the entire committee. It was just sent to the chair for information at this point. But I know it was also part of the basis for my conversation with the chair, with the MLECP, and the MNRF that happened two days ago. So, Ruth? Thank you. I, a couple of things. I always think that whether it comes from just this municipality or district as a whole, that we should continue to send resolutions that have been passed by this council on to the province. I mean, it's we, we just got to be in their face all the time, I, I would say, or at least, you know, hope to be read or heard or whatever that is. I, I want to go back to the discussion uh, about planning. And I, I looked at, for instance, a couple of things that are going to come up uh, this Thursday under planning. I'm very concerned that um, while we discuss, we know this pl flooding has impact and, and, and certainly some of us have seen it over the years. Um, we're still passing stuff that is pretty questionable in, in my opinion, that in fact, um, I think we should look at our policies a little closer. And, and for instance, why do we allow a, a, a toilet on, on the water? Something as basic as that. Why are we allowing a toilet? Forget about the fact that they built out a whole living space <laughs> on the, you know, on the main level. I mean, that's, that's their loss, but I, I certainly heard from a, a couple of uh, property owners that, you know, the things that they suffered their losses, well, in fact, it was a boathouse. It wasn't, you know, we approved a boathouse. We never approved those built-out things. But the plumbing really concerns me because I, I have seen the effects when that plumbing, those, that little movement, the pipes go, it's something as simple as that, but all I can say is, or ask, is that uh, council really start looking at the applications and even the, uh, as far as that 200 foot mark, maybe the 200 foot mark doesn't start at the water's edge. Maybe there is an actual, uh, so it allows development further up on the property, if could be, but I'm just saying that we've got to get a little bit more creative or, or um, which is not what people apply for, right? But I'm just saying that I think we really need to pay more attention of what we're approving. I understand, and the good thing is we've got an official plan update that's coming down that some of those things can go into, so uh, appreciate it. Well, then we might need to adjust our uh, comprehensive zoning bylaw on 1414. Any other comments on this before I read the resolution? Councillor Roberts. Just very quickly through you. Um, I echo, that was an excellent report. I enjoyed it. When I was reading it, it captivated me. But no, I didn't say, oh, no. But it was a good report, good pr okay, public we presentation. We have emergency services here to help you. Okay, <laughs> good, good. But I would like to know, I, 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 are, you, are the three departments coming forth during the budget process to start implementing some of the cost items example remote sensories at least in the township of Muskoka Lakes and with the other uh, Huntsville and um, Bracebridge because then you as you, uh, heard uh, uh, Chief Ryan that you were talking about uh, you know you didn't have anything are we going to start even not waiting for those other organizations are we going to do something um, I can look to the chief but I think that we are uh, looking at the province of installing in the MNRF installing those remote stations to okay. provide better data. And that's the one thing I think that the 
flood report is going to help the province provide some better reporting at their cost, not our okay. cost. Okay. So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that the comments and recommendations contained in the staff report entitled Review of the Report from Provincial Special Advisor of Flooding, dated January 15, 2020, be forwarded to the District of Muskoka, other area municipalities, at the Muskoka Watershed Advisory Group, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and that the District of Muskoka and other Muskoka area municipalities be requested to continue to work together to advocate collective concerns respecting Muskoka watershed flooding concerns to the province. Any further comments? All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. And again, I echo great job, staff. Thank you very much. Very thorough and detailed. Um, Habitat for Humanity. Um, We've got a couple, let's think, committee, what are we thinking here? We're, we may a strategic plan review, do we anticipate a lot of questions? It's more just information where we're going or do we going to more information? Uh, HR specialist, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, can we get through this? And then we've got some closed session items or do we want to take a break at this time? I'll, I'll look at it, I'm happy to take a break for 45 and come back. Do we want to take a break right now? Good point. Staff, you okay with that? Okay, so let's come back here at 1.15. Is that fair? Grants to organizations, there is a policy in place that Council has passed. Um, and uh, should Council wish to entertain the request, um, you could consider including additional funds as part of the 2020 budget, or they can um, fulfill the requirements of the policy uh, and uh, request a grant through that process. With respect to a waiver of the fees. I don't believe we're permitted to waive the fees. However, there is a rebate program in place. Uh, this property in question actually did go through a rezoning exercise uh, several years ago, and Council at the time did agree to refund those application fees. Um, so they are looking uh, at still remaining uh, building permit fees, uh, development charges, and um, uh, entranceway fees, which staff calculated to be approximately $13,000. Again, uh, staff would not recommend a formal agreement be entered into uh, that council would agree to waive the fees. However, in my opinion, the, the presence of that program and the funds in it, um, which currently there are sufficient funds to meet their request, I think in essence um, is an indication that uh, those fees will be refunded in the future. And lastly, the Adopt a Home Committee, staff suggesting that perhaps the uh, uh, relatively newly appointed Heritage and Attainable Housing Committee is well suited for that role. Um, and could uh, take that on, although the chair may wish to comment further in that regard. I'm just thankful that the chair has a pecuniary interest and can't discuss the topic. Anyone want to comment on the uh, application? Anyone want to comment on the application? <laughs> Councillor Hayes. Any other comments? Councillor Nishikawa, then Councillor Roberts. On a, on a, in a bigger picture, on a broader view, I have, I've raised this before, my concerns about our, um, our current policy and the way it's written. And it, it's very, very prohibitive to even an individual walking in off the street that is following everything that, in, that we sort of vision of what that looks like. But we, we put obstacles in the way that our, our policy is drafted. So I've asked the committee, I think I did, uh, you know, to look at that. I would suspect, though, um, the lack of, of um, experience um, and 
may, it may be lacking experience, I would say, to, to make move those things forward. Some of it is very simple, and certainly from a budget perspective, we need to throw more money into the pot. That's a bigger picture, but as I said, I'm very concerned even the way our own policies read. Okay, I'm going to let uh, Director of Planning chime in here for a moment. And uh, just again, if I'm not mistaken, we have a close to $50,000 sitting in a pot for attainable housing that we haven't accessed. So, David? Uh, that is generally correct. I uh, just note, um, and it is noted in the staff report, I believe what uh, Councillor Nishka was referring to is the attainable housing rebate program and it is in need of review and I just uh, would comment that the Heritage and Attainable Housing Committee is meeting tomorrow and that is on the agenda it was requested at a previous elite planning committee meeting for that committee to review that program and we've invited uh, District Muscoa staff to come and present um, to provide some of that background and expertise uh, to the committee in their deliberations tomorrow. Any uh, recommendations stemming from that uh, Table Housing Committee will come back to Planning Committee for further discussion. Okay, thank you. A supplemental? I just want to add, though, um, in my experience uh, sitting on that committee for 88 years, that um, district's view is not the Township of Muskoka Lakes view there they 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 have a bigger or a different provincial mandated because it's the province that issues um, <coughs> some funding directing this type of thing and and I would say that um, let's Muskoka Lakes take ownership of what we can do ourselves when we not not relying on whatever the district tells us what they're doing I think we can enhance it quite a bit and, and that actually reflects the challenges of living in Muskoka Lakes. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I echo uh, Councillor Hayes' concern with the amount of work that is coming that way in the committee. I recall this, I'm very interested in this project uh, of building this place in, in Bella, but I think there was another ask in there, and basically, and I think that's what Councillor Hayes was mentioning, is that we would actually um, prime this community effort to, and I asked at that time for a sort of a, from, from the presenter, to send a description of the responsibilities that that they would they would be expecting the township to do, and I haven't seen that yet. So it's, it was the money, yes, but then I I heard they don't have this. They wanted us to do it. Councillor Hayes. Um, Kimberly is sending that information to me for the meeting tomorrow, so uh, it, it, we will have the information, and I will make sure that it gets to all of the councillors via the clerk. Okay. Yeah, supplemental, just on that. So yes. in in approving what we're approving here. It's, it doesn't set us on the course to do this, correct? Perfect. Okay. It does not. Uh, and I'll just chime in uh, to Councillor Hayes' comment. And, and I agree that uh, right now I think generally heritage and Tamil housing, we're, we're talking about uh, potentially looking at splitting that committee. Um, no decisions made at this point. We know that coming back in February, our staff are looking at all of our committee structure type of thing and our subcommittee structure. So I think that's the appropriate point to sort of vet that through there and uh, more information to come. So. Okay, um, so but I do appreciate that uh, right now we can park this under your two hats, and uh, moved by Councillor Roberts, second by Councillor Kelly. Whereas Habitat for Humanity has identified a building project in the Township of Muskoka Lakes and requested a volunteer task force committee for the project be established. Now, therefore, be resolved, the Township of Muskoka Lakes Heritage and Attainable Housing Committee be appointed as the Township Adopt a Home Committee for the Habitat for Humanity build at 1016 Elm Street in Bow. Any comments, questions? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? That is carried. Thank you. And that committee may change too in the future. I mean, as you guys come back and it can be reappointed to somewhere else. Uh, Council composition. Ms. Lehman, over to you. Composition. Compensation, I see that. Might be comp <laughs> composition too. Freud? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. So in recent months, the General and Finance Committee has been reviewing council compensation and benefits, which has led to the recommendations before you. On the benefits side, a health spending account provides flexibility to all members of council. 
The committee chose the option of removing the life and AD&D insurances to reduce some costs uh, while increasing the health spending account and the age for travel insurance. In terms of compensation, there was a general consensus not to spend money on a consultant review or to go outside our local area for comparators and, the for, and for the positions to be at the middle or above for the group, of the group, sorry. So, um, and there, in addition, there was a discussion around mileage, which required further research and was asked to be separated from the report. So I am looking for clarification uh, to know if this is the direction of council to consider increasing mileage. And the proposal, if approved, is recommended to be effective upon budget approval, at which time the benefits and salary would be changed. Happy to answer any questions. Council. Councillor Zavitz. Your Thank committee. you. As chair of that committee, I do recall a discussion on mileage uh, being pulled out of in terms of compensation. So in terms that would be viewed as reimbursement. So and I don't recall the discussion around uh, increasing that as much as the application of uh, mileage, <coughs> you know, some parameters, further parameters around that. Councillor Shikawa. I, I suppose that uh, I, I added a, a, a partial concern, not necessarily that meeting, a previous discussion, um, that in fact with our existing committee structures um, and those that, that choose to attend because you want to educate yourselves or whatever, or you know, we, we, we should encourage that. Um, but like district, that your mileage gets compensated for that. That's the direction I was go going, that um, all meetings that councillors, because we're already, in my opinion, I know when I have to drive to Hecla, <laughs> you know, that, that is uh, a significant cost, which is, um, I, I will bear. Uh, but coming to these meetings is something that can be controlled and, and attendance taken and all of those kind of things and, and I just think that uh, it, w it would be uh, similar to the district setup that um, your mileage would be compensated. Um, just a point of I'm not sure if anybody can answer this. I actually don't believe a district, if we choose to attend a different committee meeting, we're not compensated for that. So if yes, we are. I guess I've never claimed that mileage. I don't claim any mileage. <laughs> so, they, well, they but take your, they, take they take our attendance. But I don't believe so. We have uh, quarterly a mileage application that we can submit, and that's for meetings that we are required at. So, if we served on Muskoka Tourism Board, we can claim our mileage going to and from those meetings. If we serve on <clears throat> um, Mahat or some one of the other committees and you're on that committee, you can claim mileage to that. But I believe as a councillor, if we choose to do something that we're not required to be at, that we are... Um, having the discussion with Amy back, so, and I've asked those same things. Um, when I, I'll say to her, do I need to submit uh, mm. that report that is requested every quarter? She said no because we noted your attendance at the meeting, participating in the meeting. Um, that was noted and, and it is compensated. Has for like many, many years. Okay, so I, I, again, I, I don't mean to argue. I, I've never noted and I've attended meetings and not attended meetings of standing committees. I've never noted my pay to change month to month whether I've attended a meeting or not quarter by quarter which would say I'm paid for the meeting that I'm in attendance at, not anything else, but uh, happy to ask that question. Um, I guess we could also chime in from a, our own perspective, whether the district does it or not, do we, because somebody wants to go to attend a bunch of meetings on their own accord, not being required by here, do we want to just open a blank check to them? Is it, well, I, I, I'm, I'm pushing to an extreme, but again, I want to go to this and I want to go to that and I want to do whatever, and then there is requirements of the job. And requirements of this job, I, I personally, 
100%, we need to be compensated for. Um, so I turn it over to Council. Thank you, um, Mayor Harding. I agree with you that anything we're required to go to, and that includes <coughs> board meetings, so all your trips to Hecla should be, should be in, at, at board meetings should be covered. And, uh, and the other ones that we choose to go to, if we want to go the route of declaring it as, as a independent on our tax return, which was not recommended the last time, but I think that's the option you have if you want to, to um, claim the other ones. That, that would be my feeling. Anybody else want to chime in? Councilor Mazan? Thank you, Eric. Through you. Um, and I, I think that the recommendation coming out of last uh, general finance was for this exact reason to take the, the, the reimbursement of an expense away from the conversation about our benefits because it did take a little bit more thinking than we maybe had appreciated because there are other there's members of the public who are on these committees that I hadn't necessarily considered either. Um, I, I guess the going in position would be if, if the conditions of employment have changed and it then becomes a barrier perhaps to somebody being able to conduct their job, um, a financial barrier, we should be at least exploring options to ensure people are not out of pocket in trying to do their job. So. Again, the, the basics, like if there's a requirement to do a job, I think it should be looked at. And I would just ask that staff is maybe coming back with, with their thoughts and recommendations um, on, on that. But I would separate it from the conversation we're having about okay. benefits. Which I think it is separated today. So, so does council want uh, staff to again come back and specifically talk about and options on mileage? Yes? Okay. Any comments on the resolution on the table today? Councilor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not going to be supporting this resolution, and my reasons are, as I look at the numbers, the, the increase in the uh, Appendix 2 enhanced benefits represents a 60% increase in the cost, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's a problem. And the in, in the increase in compensation represents 9.5 percent, when that compensation was only set a year ago. Uh, and for that reason, I will not be supporting it. However, I uh, I would support the compensation that's the average, as opposed to going to one particular one. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Councillor Roberts. Ashley, on uh, uh, Appendix 2, as, if you notice, there, there, uh, yes, it is going up, but then you're getting your, your health spending from 2000 to 4000 a year, which would, would, would help all uh, counselors uh, if you have a claim. So it is offset that way. And as far as the life insurance, it's, it's and that, like I say, most people have insurance, but uh, it is uh, good to have the, the health spending, and I would support that part of it. Anyone else? Just a point of clarification here, just trying to understand, read through the report. In our enhanced plan, if we approve that, are we removing life insurance and accidental death completely from the plan? Huh. But adding, but travel insurance increased to age 75. So what's our travel insurance? Help me. Yeah, it's age 70 right now. So. Um, one of the thought, I think, if my understanding is correct, is for the insured benefits, AD&D and &D life, there's a, there is an age limit on that, so it's a little restricted. Insurances and just provide a real flexible plan. Okay. Um. And we have this in one motion at this particular point in time, <laughs> correct? We have both of these, Bennett and B. Um, okay, any other further comments or questions? Um, I guess the only other question I have is, generally speaking, because it seems to me our enhanced plan, again, I apologize, I was not at the general committee last month to discuss the 2,000 or 4,000. 
that $2,000 times 10 counselors is $20,000. Looks like we're paying for that by reducing, obviously, life insurance and accidental death and a little bit of increase. Generally speaking, in our $2,000 health spending account at the end of each year, are we at, is every counselor at the 10000 or $2,000? Or are we below that? Or are we, I, I'm just trying to get a general perspective here. Um, I, I know over the years I've been close to it. Sometimes I'm not. I don't know. Thank you, Your Worship. I did not run that data, but I know when it comes to a health spending account, we really have to assume that it will be used because it's so flexible that typically it is. So it's a little, I apologize, a little vague answer, but I think it would be used. I think you would assume that it would be used, even though you would save if it wasn't used, if that's what you're getting at. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand. We're all, we're looking at saying we want $4,000, but if we're really only using $1,500, I'm just trying to understand where it is. I, I get where it comes into play. So, but no, no, I, I know we can't do that, but it may be for the one or two people who want to use the 4000 I'm just trying to understand where we're at. I'm not... I'm just trying to understand. Councillor Edwards? Uh, the thing I, I think with that is if somebody has a, a health issue and that we never know that is there and that and that um, the life insurance as far as I, 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 I can see on on this is it's, it's just a case of uh, most people have life insurance for one thing and secondly uh, hopefully nobody ever collects on that here either. I mean how many people collect on on their uh, twenty-five thousand dollar life insurance every year, they don't. Every year. Oh, it's just true. You can't die every year, though. No, that's right. Or once. It's a one and done, right? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll around. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. I wonder if I might ask um, Sarah the indication on here about the annual amount for the salary increase. No one's mentioned that, but that I believe, as I understand it. Uh, goes solely to the mayor for to bump him up to the upper average. Am I right? If I could, just to clarify. That is correct. Thank you. Uh, as a follow up uh, to that question, without it being personal, we had a lot of conversation about making things meaningful to people and I think the agreement um, the amount was dictated by something driven by some action in in Bracebridge I understand but our intention was to try and make a benefits plan that was meaningful not just to the group that was around us but to perhaps future recruiting of new counselors mm -hmm. and we agreed that you know and we talk out of one side of our mess that, that you know the poverty level is quite high and benefits is actually something that especially in an environment where there's a lot of seasonal population is a, it's a real it's a real thing so if you have to decide between taking your kids to get their teeth done or putting food on the table or paying gas to do your job right it's meaningful so we try to make this a relevant and meaningful package to not just those of us sitting around the table thanks thank you Anyone on this side? Uh, well, Councillor Roberts, Councillor Jaglitz, then Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Through, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the premium, would you know what the premium increase is for to go from 70 to 75 on the travel insurance? And I'll have a follow-up. Sorry to put it in the spot. That's okay. Don't, don't worry. I, I just won't make a point. Um, the... I have found, and I'm not the 70 mark, that when you apply for insurance with with a with a, actually our insurer, um, you go to a different category where you'll be denied um, if you have in, if you have some certain issues. So um, I and uh, I've just bring that out that just because you reach the age, you phone in, you may not get the corporate um, insurance. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. The the premium increase is only twenty cents. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you were the. You were the. <laughs> so just on travel insurance, what what is the coverage? Did you not read your policy? No, no, I get you. 
Yeah, but, but, you know, they're not writing a $5 million check for us to have open heart surgery. Well, it depends. It's emergency medical. Mm -hmm. I think there's, an, there's a limit on the policy, though. Before they do that. Okay. Hold on, Councilor Mazan. <laughs> Almost there. Do we have another question? Let me let me go to. I said I would go to Councilor Chicago, then Councilor Jagowitz first. Do you have a council? No, you said Councilor Jagowitz first. All right. I mean. Okay. Let's go to Frank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to expand on my earlier answer uh, as a result of the conversation. When I look at the uh, the enhanced benefits, I see that our current cost is twenty five thousand going to forty. So that's where I saw the sixty percent increase. <clears throat> With regard to the compensation, um, th there are six municipalities, and if you take the top one, to Georgian Bay, which is off the scale, and you average five, that compensation would come at forty four, four thirty five. It's currently at forty five five. If you averaged all six in, it would come to forty six. 500 roughly, it's at 45, 500. So what the committee has chosen or the recommendation is to move to the second highest one, the town of Huntsville. That's what creates the 9%. So I just want to clarify that for the question. The proposed increase is not bringing it to the average, it's bringing it far above the average. So I, I'm, I oppose this for those reasons I've expressed. However, I would agree to the compensation if it was the average. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go to Council Mazan who pulled up the what our benefits package is on travel insurance. Okay, so the uh, out of uh, country uh, for active participants under the age of 70 or earlier. Nine unlimited trips, lifetime coverage, two million dollars. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Councilor Nishikawa. <coughs> I, um, I wasn't at the meeting. I sent in my thoughts or wishes or whatever, uh, which I believe were, were read. All I can, again, suggest to this council is um, don't undervalue you <laughs> or us. Uh, and, and I have sat here for years and years and years of listening to how we're just mediocre. I believe that we take on a whole lot higher level responsibility than we give ourselves credit for. Um, you know, who's building a Marriott? Who's taking care of a, a hydro plant? Like, like the type of stuff that we, or even the dollar values that we are dealing with. So let's rise above personally, like let's, think that we're we are we are valuable and and so therefore because I am I'm concerned about the future I mean we've heard about we've heard this for years we don't necessarily attract certain individuals um, this council is is a is a good makeup right now but uh, I would suggest that I I'm concerned that if we don't present ourselves in a more favorable light, I don't feel in comparison to Lake of Bays and Georgian Bay. I don't see that they are dealing with some of the types of issues that we have to. Um, and again, I, I just want I just want this council to consider to think about like rise above it, right? Like we we are more mm -hmm. valuable than what we tend to appreciate what I hear around this table. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, just for the record, I don't think I'm mediocre, but I also know that we signed on for uh, this job with a full understanding of what the compensation was going to be. And I'm still hung up on the fact that we're we're still, you know, addressing each other and certain correspondence as rookies, and yet we're not, you know, rookie enough that we're afraid to wade in and deal with our own compensation. 
when when we sat down and talked about this earlier, uh, I was mollified by the fact that I thought, or maybe I'm wrong, that giving up uh, the life insurance and other small benefits would make the plan for doubling down on uh, on the um, health insurance coverage uh, kind of a wash of you know break even wash out uh, it may it may not it makes it more appropriate for me personally and much happier to have it that way but <clears throat> um, I just I just from my perspective I knew what I was signing on for I knew it was never going to knock me down with the, the financial uh, compensation. It's a lot more interesting, a lot more challenging than I thought it would be. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I think dealing with compensation, and quite frankly, I don't care what anybody gets made anywhere else. I knew what I was signing on for. I didn't sign on for a job in Lake of Bays. If I was going for the big money, I would have run there. Um, and that's really it. Okay, anyone else want to comment? Councillor Bridgman? Um, just as an add-on, I, um, I heard Councillor Nishikawa, and I think I said at that meeting, which you did not attend, it is very hard to talk about our own compensation. But my suggestion would be that we peg it to somewhere with our surrounding municipalities, but not at average. I think it should be 0 0.6, 0 0.65, because we have a huge population here and we do deal with a lot of stuff. And then it takes it out of our hands. It, it ends up being set by the market, per se, and other okay. people. That's my comment. So, um, just to chime in, Councillor Edwards, i got your microphone. It's still on. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, again, from an enhanced benefits perspective, we want to choose to do that. That's Council's decision. I'm not too worried about that. From a salary perspective, uh, as I've heard, you know, we did this changed a year ago we the reality is regularly councils are adjusting and changing and there was a big change three years ago or two years ago going into this term of council because the um, benefit package from the province changed where our salaries were a third tax-free so everybody was trying to adjust for that and then so it was sort of a moving target and where we may or may not go the exercise of are we in the middle are we above I will comment that you know councillor Jaguar's perspective of you know let's just look at Georgian Bay and they're the outliers let's get rid of them well do you take the high and the low off I mean they are part of it and, and I will say you know I, I'm I, I didn't ask for this um, and if the mayor's salary is the only one that's sort of semi-changing at the all the end of the day here. Um, you know, when we take the Georgian Bay mayor's salary off, we may take the Georgian Bay councillor's salary off, and are we all ready to go down in salary to be in the middle ground type of thing? And I'm going to probably say, no, we're not. So, um, you know, you can't just take the high. You have to take the high and low off if you want to do then the middle three, four. But um, the numbers are the numbers, and we can choose to say we accept this at a 60th percentile. There's no question. Just understand what we represent I say this regularly is 11 billion dollars worth of assessed value that's the same as Bracebridge Huntsville and Gravenhurst combined we are tasked with more as a council uh, I, I heard the mayor of we get our complaints Mayor of Muskoka Lakes gets the multi-million dollar complaints and they complain a lot more and everybody around this table knows that because of they have a bigger vested interest in it so um, I, I, I don't disagree with anything that's forward here and if we want to be equal as such with our comparators and those people in the area again the $4,000 health spending account is what Bracebridge gets if I'm not mistaken it's pretty close to that is it not I thought they were getting four grand. In a prior report, they had four thousand. Yeah, apologize, Mr. Mayor. So in the prior report, and then the the salaries, I was asked to go back and look a little deeper. So that was something. It was in one of their reports, but they just contemplated it. It wasn't passed. That's where the idea came from. So. Okay. Um, so we have we have. Two options on the table right now. We have an Appendix A, or one, and Appendix Two. Um, can I just ask, do we contemplate going from 2,000 to 3,000? I mean, we can put a million variables in there, but it's certainly going to mitigate the cost. Um, 
if in round numbers, it's going to be about ten thousand dollars a year less, I would assume, potentially, um, to the overall budget. So it'd only be a five thousand dollar increase to go to three thousand dollars health spending. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, Mayor. So again, it, and here we are talking about committee structure again. Um, this came to the committee twice, and three thousand dollars was discussed. Four thousand dollars was discussed. Two thousand dollars was discussed. We have discussed this to death. We've all agreed that there's no shame in talking about it, but at the end of the day, we just simply make, need to make a decision. So, I have a problem as as the sorry as the chair, respectfully, that we can all of a sudden just say, "Okay, let's let's do it three, and then we're going to vote on three. To me, I think the whole thing's flawed now, and I think we should go back. I don't even know where to go, quite honestly. But if, should it go back to committee? Uh, does it go back to staff for more consideration, or do we? Just What the committee structure did, and if I read the notes from the committee last time, it was a consensus of committee that a report come for consideration, okay, option A, and the financials are now coming to council. So we know what their actual cost is. So we could have brought it back to committee at the count, and the committee could have done the $15,000 plus or minus, and maybe we got to a different whatever, but we didn't have all the information, I don't believe, at the committee level that we're being presented with today. And we did. We, at my position, sorry. Respectfully, we, we did. So okay. my, my point is that um, I'm, it confuses me greatly because here we should either, it seems to me, we should either vote it down and we're not going to get a raise at all, or we should go back to the committee. Or, or accept it. You never know. Well, okay, fine. So then let's vote. So my point is then let's just vote. But if we vote and we vote against it or... That's fine. So, so okay, respectfully, I, I'm, I don't have a problem. Committee has recommended this coming forward, right? Does anyone have any further comments on this recommendation of our committee? Councillor Nishikawa, I'm going to read the question. Uh, again, I, I was actually surprised at the report. Uh, um, sitting around when we did have the in increase in last committee, we didn't actually have, just so folks understand, we didn't those health spending areas have not changed for many, many years. Um, and that um, it, it really was, the increase was about that change in the provincial government uh, and, and how we were addressing the tax, that one third. So I, I don't want people to think that we are, are you know, and, and I look at some of these numbers when we're discussions and I was gonna say, and you know what, next, next week, so again, let's not undercut ourselves, not ourselves, I mean the, the role as a counselor, because we're going to go and approve a consultant <laughs> for $100,000 for something that will decide whether or not we like the report. Like it's, it, I just don't think, think that we always put things into perspective. Um, and, and you know, so we're talking about this, this increase. Uh, but yet we don't give a whole lot of discussion about so many other hundreds of thousands of dollars that we spend. So I'm just going to ask the question to get an idea so that we have two options on the table. One is a salary, one is a benefits line. Okay. Um, are people generally just, do we need to split these into two resolutions or we're okay, people are equal on both yes or both no? Oh. Councilor uh, Edwards? Might as well split them and then, you know, it is. But uh, this um, counselor line, is this with the the cost of living for this year or uh, or will that be coming as well? Sir. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the cost of living has not been applied yet. Okay, so we go up a little bit. Okay. Okay, so I've got one who wants to split it. I've got, no, don't need to split, don't need to split it. You're okay on both? Okay, I think we're okay just to leave this as both resolutions. I'm going to read this resolution, moved by Councillor Zavitz, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved, Township Council, uh, compensation rates be reflected as described in the January 15th, 2020 staff report, and the Township Council benefits package be enhanced as described in Appendix 2 in the January 15th, 2020 staff report, effective upon final budget approval. Any further comments? All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those opposed? That motion is carried.
Thank you. Mr. Hammond, over to you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'll be brief. The uh, report before you provides an overview of the phasing as well as schedule related to the update of the strategic plan. Uh, Appendix 1 identifies the uh, schedule and phasing in a little bit more detail. Uh, as well, I have made arrangements with the consultant for those members who can't attend the goal setting workshop on the 28th. The consultant will reach out to them directly or collectively in a conference call either prior to the 28th or uh, after the 28th, depending on schedules. So I'm really pleased that the consultant was able to accommodate uh, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Any comments on the uh, proposed timeline? and uh, information as presented. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Madam Clerk, we want some bylaws? A road closing bylaw? Or where do you want to go? First bylaws are on... Planning? Who's up? Mr. Allen? McKinney. McKinney. McKinley. That's one. Okay. Mr. Allen. Um, I guess as an overview, is there any changes? Do we ever recommend anything that's different from planning? There what, maybe I'll provide a bit of background. Thank you. Uh, zoning by law amendment 3819 was approved to permit a dock width of 107 feet. Uh, the applicant had proposed to retain a portion of this to be removed. However, during the uh, public meeting, it was revealed that there were some CU lifts that also contributed to dock length as well as had a setback issue. Uh, so the direction from planning committee was that those We had received comments of uh, no objection from the district of Muskoka as well as uh, the townships, department, development services, public works, and emergency services. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments on this at this time? So I will read uh, first and second reading. Moved by Councillor Hayes, second by Councillor Zavitz. Be it resolved that bylaw 2019-141 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 McKinley and Espen, rule 227-53-1, be read a first and second time. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? That is carried. Any minor amendments? Yes. Thank you. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the uh, CDU lift was Travis. located on the side okay. of the boathouse, resulting in 111 feet of frontage and a 16.5 foot side yard setback. Okay. Any comments from? Uh Uh, and this amendment is minor in nature and does not require further public circulation. It's hereby approved prior to third reading. The minor amendment shall prohibit any further dock additions on the property and provide required exemptions to permit the existing PWC lifts. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? That is carried. Third and final, moved by Councillor Hayes, second by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved, bylaw 2019 141. McKinley and Espen be read a third fine in time and finally passed. All those in favor? And opposed. And that one is carried. Thank you. Okay. Uh, pool. Excuse me. Before we move on to the next, oh, like any to impacts. impacts? Did anybody have any uh, neighboring impacts or impacts from submissions? I don't believe so because there was none received. So I think we're good. Uh, pool application. Thank you. This uh, next uh, application is in the name of Pool, as you had mentioned, Mr. Mayor. Zoning bylaw amendment 4019. There was a proposal to permit a second sleeping cabin on this lot, as well as a requirement to impose a holding zone, which would not be lifted until a satisfactory D4 assessment has been completed. Okay. Uh, we have received comments of uh, no objection from the District of Muskoka, as well as the Development Services and Public Works Department of the Township. Okay. So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Roberts, second by Councillor Hayes, be it resolved by law 2019-145 to amend comprehensive zoning by law 2014-14 pool rule 2573, be read a first and second time. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? No. That's carried. Minor amendment? No. No minor amendment. Thank you very much. 
Uh, moved by Councillor Hayes, second by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved by Law 2019-145 pool. Be read a third time and finally passed. Any further comments? All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you. Any impact uh, on the uh, council or committee? I think we're good. Riley. Thank you. The last zoning bylaw amendment that was heard by the planning committee and has been brought to uh, council for consideration, zoning bylaw amendment 4119, the name of Riley. There was a proposal to permit a microbrewery as an accessory use. We'd receive no comments from the public, no objections from the District of Muskoka, um, no objections from the Development Services Department. However, uh, the Public Works Department did uh, provide some comments related to access. Uh, the comments are attached to your agenda if you'd like to read them in detail. I think we're probably okay. Let me read the first and second. Moved by Councillor Roberts, second by Councillor Hayes. Be a resolved by Law 2019-146 to amend comprehensive zoning by Law 2014-14. Riley Rule 9808. Uh, be read a first and second time. All those in favor? Carried. Moved by Councillor Roberts, second by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved by Law 2019-146, Riley be read a third time and finally passed. All those in favor? That one is carried. Thank you. Any impacts from the neighbors? There were no comments from the neighbors, so I'm assuming no impacts. Mr. Allen, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Madam Clerk, where am I going? Road closings? Uh, theming. theming bylaws. Uh, moved by Councillor Kelly, second by Councillor Roberts, be it resolved by Law 2019-163 to deem lots 15, 15A, 15B on Plan M362 Watt, not be lots of Plan of Subdivision, Julie, Roll 2968, be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. Any comments? All those in favour? That one's carried, thank you. Okay, we've got three road closings. I'm going to read them all. Well, first thing we have to do is declare these surplus and then we can close them. Moved by Councillor Edwards, second by Councillor Zavitz. Be it resolved, the Township Council declare a portion of original shore road allowance on Skeleton Lake, concession 2, lot 10, Cardinal, uh, Kurzman, rule 12164, as surplus land. And the clerk is hereby instructed to dispose of said property pursuant to section 8911, Municipal Act 2001, and further that bylaw 2020 to stop up, close, and convey a portion of original shore road allowance designated as part 2 on 35. R25971, be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. Any further comments? All those in favor? That was carried. Thank you. Another one moved by Councillor Edwards, second by Councillor Zavitz. Be a resolved township council to declare portions of original shore road allowance on Lake Muskoka concession 10, lot 27, Monk. Kyle et al. Rule 91157 uh, as surplus, and that the clerk be hereby instructed to dispose of said property. Pursuant to sections 8, 9, 11 of Municipal Act 2001, and further bylaw 202006 to stop up, close, and convey those portions of original shore road allowance, designated parts 3 and 5 on 35R25898, be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. Any comments? All those in favor? Carried. One more for the trilogy. Moved by Councillor Edwards, second by Councillor Zavitz. Be it resolved that Township Council declare a portion of a closed. Uh, Flooded original shore road allowance on Lake Muskoka, concession 13, lot 33, Monk Benson, rule 914-4910 as surplus land. And that the clerk is hereby instructed to dispose of the said property pursuant to sections 8, 9, 11 of Municipal Act 2001, for the bylaw 2020-07 to convey the closed portion of original shore road allowance, designated as part 3 on 35R25741, be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. Any further comments, questions? All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay. I think so. Yeah, we've we've talked to the citizen committee. So I have a bylaw, uh, or sorry, uh, resolution moved by Councillor Zavitz, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved, the following bylaws be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. 2021, to establish rates of interest on all arrears of tax. 2020-02, to establish a penalty charge for non-payment of current taxes. 2020-03, to provide an interim levy. 2020-04, to borrow, if necessary, to meet current expenditures for 2020. 2020-09, to amend bylaw 2019-65, 2020-01, 
to establish and appoint members of the advisory committees. 2020-10, to amend bylaw 2019-64, to appoint citizen members to the community center boards. 2020-11, to regulate the weight of vehicles over Bala Bay Dock Bridge. 2020-12, to amend bylaw 1986-133, traffic regulations. 2020-13, to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute and affects corporate seal to the road maintenance service agreement between the District of Muskoka and the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Any further comments? Oh, one more. And by law 2020-14, snuck on top here to establish and define the duties and powers of the Chief Administrative Officer. You need those ones. Are you ready to vote or do you have a question? I, I haven't yet, but I was about to. I, I, no, I did, but I, I missed one. Councilman Ishikawa. I just wanted it to know, I, I heard earlier that um, uh, the chairs of committees were given notice uh, um, and my my deputy or whatever, our coach, we did, if, we were, did If there was not. a change, I believe. Well, we have an addition. So. Oh, I apologize. Okay, that's it. My we just We just were not, so, okay. this was not brought forward to us. Okay. Okay. Any other comments or questions? You've all heard the resolution. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Where are we going? Closed session? Yeah, we're just putting a time in here. So we're not talking about anything else. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Don't infect everybody else. No, people. No, we're not. Council, if I may, moved by Council Roberts, seconded by Council Kelly. Be it resolved that Council, uh, in closed session, convene at uh, 2:09 p.m. for personal matters about an identifiable, in, identifiable individual, including matters municipal or local board employees. One matter, labor regulation or employee negotiations. One matter, and a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. One potential disposition matter. Pursuant to Section 239.2 of Municipal Act 2001. All those in favor? Yes. Carried. Let's take five minutes before we get into the heavy lifting. Thank you. Sure.